However, the curse of Frank Fiala, there really was no other word for it, continued to plague Sammy. Although the police investigation into Fiala's murder failed to turn up any suspects, indeed no one was ever charged, it was learned from friends of Fiala's that he was in the process of buying the discotheque from Sammy Gravano and large secret cash payments were involved. One report put the amount at $500,000, another had it at $300,000. Fiala's widow arrived from Virginia and appeared with lawyers representing her late husband's estate. Sammy saw to it that Fiala's down payment check for the plaza suite was returned, which appeared to satisfy her. But then the Internal Revenue Service began a massive investigation. Agents swarmed all over Cream Ridge, New Jersey, where Sammy had his horse farm retreat. I had a good reputation out there, he said. Nobody knew anything about me except that I had a nice wife and kids and was a good neighbor, a good tipper. But the agents are everywhere saying I'm a gangster and a big tax evader. I think only one guy said anything bad about me. He was a breeder. He had this yearling that was going to be sold at auction. I went to him and said I wanted to buy the horse before the auction. I would give him 30000 cash. The way he told it to the agents, he made it sound like it was under the table. When I was questioned, I tried to explain what I meant about cash was that I would be paying the whole thing up front. No loans, no partial payments. Of course, this breeder could have done whatever he wanted with the money. That was his business. But it was a small country town, and with all the agents, I became like a celebrity. Every place I went, I saw people whispering. Nobody did nothing or said nothing right out. It was all whispers. I wish the agents would have understood that I didn't do anything mob-wise out there. This is where I got away from everything, to have a different life. But what did they care? So it was basically ruin for me and my family. I could tell people were getting leery of me. Let's face it, a lot of little devils cheat on their taxes, and they didn't want agents seeing them associate with me. So it was time for me to get rid of the farm. It broke my heart, but I didn't have a choice. There was one good memory selling the farm. I had a special cart made so you could put it behind a horse instead of a sulky. It had a steel cage around it and was really secure for the kids to ride in. When the real estate woman who sold the farm for me saw it, she asked if she could buy it for her grandchildren. I said I'd think about it. I'd given her an exclusive on the farm, but when the time ran out, I told her not to worry. If she sold it, she would get her full commission. And she did sell it. At the closing, she said, Sammy, do you remember I'd like to buy that cart? The guy who's getting the farm said, Doesn't that belong to me? Aren't I purchasing all the equipment? I said, No, if you look at the list, the cart's not there. I already gave it away. He says, who to? And I said, to this lady. It's for her grandchildren. And I told her to pick it up. I wasn't charging her anything. Now the agents are all over her, trying to find out if funny stuff was involved in the sale, if I got cash under the table or anything else. She said that there was absolutely nothing like that. She told them when her exclusivity ran out, I still paid her a full commission, and it was done on a handshake. She said the minute they walked out of her office, she was going to call me and tell me they'd been there and all the questions they asked, which she did do. As the IRS investigation continued, it became clear to Sammy that he would have to declare income on at least part of the cash he had received from Fiala. In preparation for this, he gave $50,000 to each of his two passive partners in the plaza suite, the Colombo Capo and the Genovese Soldier. He gave a substantial broker's commission to Garofala. He gave $10,000 to each of his men who participated in the hit. Then his lawyer accountant, Nicholas Gravanti, gave Sammy the wrong advice. He told Sammy that it would require time to work everything out. Sammy would declare the income the following year. That's when the tax would be paid. 
The IRS, meanwhile, was tracking down the original cashier's check from Fiala, tracing it to the dummy account and to the armored car company where Joseph Ingracia, Joe the check casher, picked up the cash and passed it on to Sammy. Sammy, Garofala, and Ingracia were indicted May 24, 1985, on charges of trying to bilk the government out of taxes on a $1 million sale of a Brooklyn discotheque. Multiple counts included conspiracy to defraud the government, attempted income tax evasion, and violation of the Bank Secrecy Act, which mandated reporting any domestic currency transaction that amounted to $10,000 or more. If convicted, the three defendants each faced a maximum of 20 years in prison and fines of $530,000. Sammy was accused of secretly receiving $650,000. Garofala was alleged to have gotten $40,000. In announcing the indictments, the U.S. attorney in Brooklyn said the case stemmed from the murder of a Brooklyn businessman, although he did not link the murder to the three defendants. Sammy then retained one of the city's leading defense lawyers, Gerald Shargel. The federal prosecutors charged that Sammy had finally paid the taxes, $300,000, simply because he knew the government was closing in on him. They also claimed that Sammy had been trying to separate himself from Fiala's murder. On the stand, Gravanti swore that he and he alone was responsible for Sammy's late payment. He had misunderstood the pertinent statutes. He had made a terrible and inexcusable mistake. In admitting this, he said, he knew he was putting his accountant's certification on the line. But the truth was the truth. The prosecution immediately objected, and the judge agreed, sharply rebuking Gravanti. Ignorance of the law was no defense, particularly when as egregious as this. On the other hand, the judge forbade any mention that Sammy and Garofala had alleged mob ties. It wasn't relevant to the case that the government had brought, nor was the murder of Fiala. Prosecutors were limited to saying only that he had died while the sale of the disco was taking place. When the jury adjourned for deliberations, a number of inquiries were sent out regarding Garofala and Ingracia, who were marginal figures during the trial. It sounds to me like they're going to get off, Shargel told Sammy. The bad news was that in Shargel's view, Sammy was going to be found guilty on some of the counts. He was resigned to his fate, but Shargel had underestimated himself. In an impassioned summation, laced with sarcasm, Shargel had described Sammy as a really smart crook. What an ingenious plot! Here he was, accused of evading taxes, which in fact he did file and pay. All right, he was a year late. It was a mistake, a bad one. But how did this happen? Because Sammy listened to presumably expert advice. He relied on it. He went to his lawyer and accountant. What, Shargel demanded of the jurors, would any of them do in similar circumstances? Would they file when their professional advisors told them to? Or would they just file whenever they felt like it, completely disregarding what had been recommended? The jury acquitted Garofala and Ingracia, and Sammy. The courtroom was packed with law enforcement officials. Like Shargel, they were certain Sammy would be convicted. They were like sharks circling for the kill, Sammy said. You should have seen their faces when I walked out. Shargel noticed that Sammy wasn't jumping for joy either. What's the matter, he said. You won, you should be happy. I just lost my brother, Sammy said. He was like my right arm. It had happened the night before. Stymie, Joe D'Angelo, had been shot dead. Sammy got the call at home from Huck around 3 a.m. 
Huck tried to be careful on the phone, and finally Sammy said, Just tell me what the fuck you're talking about. Then Huck said that the shooting had taken place in a bar and restaurant in Bensonhurst called Tolly's that Stymie and Sammy had bought together. I think it's finished with Stymie, Huck said. Sammy rushed over the Verrazano Bridge. He met Huck outside Tolly's. Police were everywhere. He and Huck went to the hospital where Stymie had been taken. Stymie's wife, Karen, was there sobbing. Sammy found an ER doctor who said, He's gone. He was DOA. Sammy insisted on seeing the body. I could hardly recognize him, he remembered. He came out, tried to console Stymie's wife, and had Huck take her home. Sammy spent the rest of the night putting together the story. Apparently, a young Colombo family associate, about to be proposed, stoned and drunk, had gone into a bar, the Green Lantern, not far from Tali's. A female manager ran it for the Genovese family. She was about to close up. The Colombo associate began cursing her, demanded drinks, and ended up helping himself to the cash register before leaving. The woman knew Stymie and in tears went to Tolly's to relate what had taken place. Stymie told her to calm down and go to her friends. They would straighten this out. As he was speaking to her, the same man, still coked up, stumbled into Tolly's. That's him, she said. From what I found out, Stymie got up and called this guy every name in the book and told him to get the fuck out. Within minutes, the Colombo associate returned. Stymie's back was to the door when he entered, holding a 9 millimeter. Someone yelled. As Stymie turned, the first bullet caught him in the side of his head. More bullets were pumped into him as he lay on the floor. The next night, after his acquittal on the tax evasion charges, Sammy went to Toto Orello. Toto arranged a meeting with Paul Castellano, during which Sammy explained the circumstances of Stymie's death. He wanted vengeance. A few days later, Castellano held a second meeting at the house of Tommy Bellotti's aunt. All the main guys are there. Me, Frankie DeChico, obviously Tommy, John Gotti, Paul said. After all, from what I hear, Stymie... Abuse this guy something awful. I could see Frankie's neck swelling. Paul, he said, this guy took out a guy we were going to make a friend of ours. He was like Sammy's brother. You mean to say that if we curse at somebody, they may have the right to kill us? So Paul backs right off and said he wanted a vote about whacking this guy, no matter what the Colombo family's position was, even if it means all-out war. I said, he's got to go. And everybody votes the same, except Jimmy Brown. He's a captain, with his garbage collections and all, but he ain't no tough guy. I guess he's there as an advisor. He said, Paul, whatever you want is okay with me. And Paul said, I'm not asking you that. What I want is what you think. And Jimmy said, oh, well, you put it that way. I'm with everybody else. Paul authorizes me and Frankie to meet with the Colombo people. They have already got a strong beef from the Genovese family for what this guy did in the Green Lantern. But I have the lead. That wasn't nothing compared to what happened to Stymie. So we go see Scappy, Tony Scarpati. He's a captain, but right then he's the acting boss of the Colombos. He said that they have this guy stashed away. He asked if they can't keep him alive for a while. The reason? The guy owed the family 90000 on some deal and they wanted to collect. I was infuriated. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I said, that's your interest? You're putting money ahead of what happened? I'll tell you what. Give me the kid. I'll pay you the ninety. You'll get your ninety. I want the kid and I want him alive. Carmine Persico was away at this time, so I don't know if he got involved. But maybe a week later, I got the word 
they ended up killing the guy themselves. Some years later, somebody talked, and the cops eventually found what was left of him buried on a beach somewhere on Staten Island. So now I only had one Luca Brasi left, old man Peruta. I noticed he'd stopped going to the track in the afternoon like he always did. I said, Joe, why don't you go out there with your son and enjoy yourself? No, he told me, Stymie ain't here no more. I'll be with you at your side until the day I die. And he was. Chapter 12 It was all around amongst us that people with John were heavy, heavy in drugs. By 1981, the New York office of the FBI was finally geared up to mount a concerted strategic assault against the city's Cosa Nostra families. Except for the initiative of individual agents from time to time, it had been an effort that had languished for the past decade. This was largely due to a mindset at the Bureau's Washington headquarters dating back to the number-crunching days of J. Edgar Hoover and his use of statistics to get the large congressional appropriations he desired. Quantity, not quality, was what counted. The result was wholesale arrests of small-time operators running illegal card and dice games loan sharks and bookmakers, with sentences suspended or jail time of a year or so at best. There was little interest in long-term investigations aimed at the organized crime hierarchy, where only a handful of convictions, no matter how important, might be obtained. Also, two critical law enforcement tools against Cosa Nostra had been badly underutilized. One was the 1970 Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO. The other was the Title III electronic surveillance provisions contained in an omnibus crime bill that had become federal law two years earlier. The problem with RICO was that the Justice Department and the FBI did not fully appreciate its ramifications, even though RICO's architect, G. Robert Blakey, a law professor at Notre Dame, tried again and again to pound home the message. And the message was that RICO was aimed at a systematic pattern of criminal activity. Any two of 30-odd specific criminal acts, murder, extortion, loan sharking, and so on, that could be linked to a particular Cosa Nostra family would allow the government, in theory, to go after that family and targeted members of it as a criminal enterprise in and of itself, with penalties far more severe than the old conspiracy laws that were relied upon in the past. The concept was so novel that the Justice Department was hesitant to move on it. Instead, it was being used, and not often, in cases involving mob infiltration of legitimate businesses, turning them into criminal enterprises. The problem with Title III electronic surveillance, which had also been authored by Blakey, was not that the FBI lacked the most sophisticated eavesdropping devices. It was that this was the domain of the Bureau's Foreign Counterintelligence Division, which was adamant about not giving an inch to the criminal division's needs. The objection was more than territorial. In organized crime trials, the courts might force the FBI to reveal not only what technology was being used, but the techniques that had been employed. A foreign counterintelligence supervisor told his organized crime counterpart, if you think we're giving this up for some fucking gambling case, you're fucking nuts. But in 1979, after the appointment of Judge William Webster as the FBI's new director, there was a sea change in the Bureau's culture. Blakey's incessant lobbying paid off. Using the RICO statutes, along with the increased manpower available, quality investigations, however time-consuming, were encouraged. 
The plan was now to document a pattern of criminal activity, connect it to a crime family, and convict the family as a criminal enterprise along with its responsible members. The views of an agent named Jim Kallstrom also prevailed. Blakey had insisted that phone taps and bugs granted by a judge for probable cause were key components to the success of RICO, and Kallstrom subscribed to it totally. Meanwhile, the courts had begun handing down rulings that increasingly protected the integrity of sophisticated listening devices in criminal cases. Kallstrom, an ex-Marine officer and Vietnam veteran, and now a no-nonsense, experienced and patient, organized crime agent in the New York office, pressed relentlessly for the creation of a special operations team devoted to physical and electronic surveillance. He wanted not only first-class technicians, but access to the latest technology and a team that was knowledgeable in the ways of Cosa Nostra that would include break-in experts and sharpshooters to cover black bag entries. And he got his way. I'm not looking for a quick fix, Kallstrom told one and all about Cosa Nostra, or some dumb gambling case. I want the top guys, the movers and shakers, and I don't care how long it takes. That was exactly how Agent Bruce Mao felt. In the renewed combat against the New York families, Mao headed up the Gambino squad, which would be designated Squad C-16. Tall, taciturn, and reflective, the Iowa-born Mao was an Annapolis graduate trained in electrical engineering. After graduation, he was assigned to the Navy's nuclear underseas fleet and served aboard an attack submarine, one that would seek out and follow Soviet missile subs for weeks at a time during the height of the Cold War. It was tense and exhilarating duty. But then he was promoted and faced a desk-bound future. And the truth was that engineering had lost its appeal. He resigned his commission and joined the FBI in hopes of rediscovering some of the excitement and meaning to life that he craved. At last, his goal was achieved with the Gambino squad. He'd previously been on organized crime duty in New York and had been as frustrated as Kallstrom. But now it was different. The targets had been upgraded. Given the opportunity, Mao had chosen to go after the Gambino family. It was precisely the sort of challenge he had been yearning for. Only the Genovese family rivaled the Gambino family in power. And at that stage of the game, the Gambinos were infinitely more mysterious. Mao would be essentially starting from scratch. He knew that the family boss was Castellano, Della Croce was the underboss, and Joe N. Gallo, the consigliere. He also knew that except for Della Croce, who had spent time in prison on an income tax evasion conviction, hardly the sort of prosecution Mao envisioned, none of them had seen the inside of a cell for as long as anyone could remember. To his dismay, he discovered that there were no ongoing cases against any of the three. Months were required to recruit the personnel Mao wanted. To start compiling background on the family leadership, he assigned agents to surveil Castellano, Della Croce, and Gallo simply to learn what their daily routine was, where they met, whom they saw. Mao had no idea how many crews were in the family or the identity of most of the captains, much less the soldiers and associates. Mao did know, however, that a maid family member, John Gotti, who was a swashbuckling neighborhood figure in Ozone Park in Queens, immediately north of JFK Airport, who operated out of the quaintly named Bergen Hunt and Fish Social Club. He knew that Gotti was the acting captain of a crew headquartered there, which had been run by the semi-retired Carmine Fatico, that Gotti did little to hide the fact that he was a connected mobster, that he was considered a celebrity on the streets of Ozone Park, and that on each 4th of July 
he sponsored a huge and illegal local fireworks display without interference from the police, while his crew grilled hot dogs and hamburgers by the hundreds, and ice cream vendors were brought in to hand out free cones and pops to hordes of delighted children. It wasn't Gotti's swaggering ways or thumb-the-nose attitude toward law enforcement, however, that caused Mao, as soon as the Gambino squad became operational, to designate Gotti his number one target. Gotti's misfortune was that the only reliable sources of intelligence about the Gambino family that the FBI had in place at the time of Mao's arrival concerned Gotti. One of these sources was a bookmaker with close ties to the Bergen crew, who, hoping to hedge his own bets against future run-ins with the law, began reporting Gotti's obsessive sports gambling, especially on football and basketball. Gotti was a big-time player and a big-time loser. He always paid his debts, not out of some moral sense, but because to do otherwise would bring about immediate dishonor in mob circles. Gotti resided in a modest Cape Cod-style house in the Howard Beach section of Queens, adjacent to Ozone Park. His sole recorded income at the time was a $25,000 annual salary as a salesman for a plumbing supply company. On a given weekend, the bookmaker confided, Gotti would lose that much or more. Where was the money coming from? The bookmaker suggested narcotics trafficking. Gotti's crew was heavily engaged in heroin and cocaine. He singled out Angelo Ruggiero's brother, Sal, a millionaire heroin dealer, who was in fact now a wanted fugitive. There was Angelo himself, Gotti's brother, Gene, John Carneglia, and Anthony Tony Roach Rampino. It was all around amongst us, Sammy said, that people with John were heavy, heavy in drugs. Personally, I don't believe John ever did it himself, but he had to know what was going on. I mean, there's Jeannie, his own brother, Angie Ruggiero, who he grew up with, the other guys with him, Johnny Carneglia, Eddie Lino, and Tony Roach, who not only had a reputation for drugs, but was an ex-junkie. What I think is John just took the money and didn't ask no questions. I think that's what Paul Castellano did, probably a lot more. But Mao also had an informant far more important than the bookmaker. His name was Willie Boy Johnson. He, too, had grown up with John Gotti. His mother was Italian, his father a Cherokee Indian. He had love tattooed on the knuckles of one hand and hate on those of the other. When Gotti became associated with the Fatico crew, he brought Johnson along using him as an errand boy and an enforcer to collect overdue loans. Willie Boy became embittered because, after he was jailed on a robbery conviction, Fatico failed to care for his wife and children during his incarceration. In 1971, to even the score, after an arrest for extortion, he became a source for the FBI concerning events inside the Bergen Hunt and Fish Social Club. Although on the surface, Willie Boy played the obedient Tonto to Gotti's Lone Ranger, he seemed to take special pleasure in reporting what Gotti was up to. Gotti's idea of humor left plenty to be desired, and Johnson seethed with resentment as Gotti delivered derisive asides about redskins and half-breeds and often treated him as a second-class citizen. In return for his information, Johnson received cash payments from the FBI and operated on the assumption that if he were ever caught in criminal activity, his cooperation would be taken into account. No one tried to dissuade him on this score. He was too valuable. Willie Boy was the informant who identified Gotti as part of the hit team that murdered James McBratney, the kidnapper of Carlo Gambino's nephew. In 1979, Johnson reported that Gotti, his brother Gene, and Angelo Ruggiero had been formally made members in the Gambino family. 
He also reported that Gotti was Neil Della Croce's prize protege. He relayed news of Gotti's deepening anger that despite Della Croce's best efforts, Paul Castellano had thus far refused to change his status from acting to official capo of the Bergen crew. He confirmed what the bookmaker had indicated, that heroin and cocaine trafficking was rampant in the crew. He also confirmed Gotti's uncontrollable gambling and his penchant for womanizing night after night to such a degree that half the following day was gone before Gotti crawled out of bed. In 1980, a Howard Beach neighbor of Gotti's, a man named John Favara, who worked in a Long Island convertible bed factory, was driving home. Suddenly, a boy on a borrowed minibike darted into the street from behind a dumpster. Favara had no time to break, and the boy was killed. He was 12-year-old Frank Gotti, apparently the apple of his father's eye. Friends of Favara's suggested that it might be wise to vacate Howard Beach permanently and right away. Even one of Favara's parish priests cautioned him not to attend the funeral. At first, Favara shrugged off the warnings. It had been a dreadful accident. It wasn't his fault, as anyone with half a brain knew. What his friends were hinting at only happened in the movies. Then he found a funeral card and a photograph of young Frank in his mailbox. A female voice phoned a death threat. The hood of his car was spray-painted with a single word, murderer. A woman, Favara later said, approached him in his driveway and struck him with a metal baseball bat. After that, Favara decided to move, but he never got the chance. On the verge of closing on the sale of his Howard Beach house, he left his factory job and walked to the parking lot of a nearby diner where he usually parked. He was intercepted by three males. One clubbed Favara, and he was hustled into a van. That was the last anyone saw of him. The word on the streets of Howard Beach and Ozone Park was that he had been chainsawed to death. At the time, John Gotti was in Florida. Not even Willie Boy Johnson could confirm the circumstances of Favara's disappearance. There had been no discussion at all about it in the Bergen crew. Gotti, Johnson told the Gambino squad, was a rising star in the family. There were any number of men who could have abducted and killed Favara on their own in hopes of gaining his favor. But what intrigued Bruce Mao more than any of the information Johnson passed on was his almost offhand remark that because of Gotti's nightly carousing, Angelo Ruggiero had become his straw boss for the crew. If Gotti was the crew's acting captain, Johnson said, Ruggiero was the assistant acting captain, and Ruggiero ran off at the mouth to the point where behind his back he was called quack, quack. Moreover, in Johnson's presence, he'd boasted that he could easily foil any FBI attempts to tap his telephone. When he wanted to talk business, he would use a princess phone that had a separate line listed in his daughter's name. Mao had been searching for a weak link to exploit, and Ruggiero provided this opportunity. The first case that the Gambino squad opened was titled 183A-1550. It was directed at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Social Club. Its designated targets were John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero. Based on what had been thus far ascertained, Bruce Mao obtained a probable cause court-authorized wiretap on the phone of Ruggiero's daughter in November 1981. By then, Gotti had every reason to believe that being the Bergen crew's acting captain was the beginning of much greater things to come for him. As it would turn out, that Title III tap was the beginning of Gotti's undoing. It was Gotti's first misfortune that the FBI's initial sources of information about the Gambino family centered on the Bergen crew. His second misfortune was that Mao was a bachelor with no personal obligations to a wife or children, 
who devoted his every waking moment to the pursuit of the Gambino family in general and John Gotti in particular. With any luck, Gotti could lead him to Della Croce and Castellano. One of Ruggiero's daily tasks was to rouse his captain by noon. As FBI tapes rolled, Gotti's groggy voice would be heard answering the phone. Yeah? John, how you doing? A grunt, a throat-clearing cough. Finally, okay, Ange, okay. Time to rise and shine, Johnny boy, okay? Ruggiero jovially coaxed. Okay, okay, Ange, come on, okay. Fifteen minutes later, Ruggiero would call again to make sure Gotti was up and about. You got your coffee? Yeah, yeah, Ange. One Sunday, during a call from Ruggiero, Gotti began a litany of the losses he was facing at that very hour. I bet Buffalo six dimes, six thousand dollars, and they're getting killed. I bet New England six dimes. I'm getting killed with New England. I bet three dimes on Kansas City. They're winning, but maybe they'll lose too, those motherfuckers. Ruggiero then phoned Gotti's brother, Gene. Something had to be done about John's gambling. He wouldn't listen to me, Gene Gotti said. Then, in another conversation with Gene, Ruggiero made a slip. He asked an oblique question about a heroin deal, asking if it had gone down. Yeah, Gene Gotti said without elaborating. On this initial tap, Ruggiero didn't talk on the phone about specific murders or drug trafficking. Still, the squad was compiling a wealth of intelligence about the Gambino family. Who the players were, who was in favor, who wasn't, which enabled Mao to start drawing up an all-important, accurate chart of the family organization. Ruggiero proved to be a non-stop talker and an incurable gossip. Every other Sunday, he would drive to the White House on Tote Hill to report to Castellano about the activities of the Bergen crew and the profits the boss could expect from the crew's hijacking and gambling operations. Back home, he was immediately on the phone complaining about Paul Castellano's high-handed manner, Tommy Bellotti at his side. He sneered that Castellano was a milk drinker and a pansy. He put down Castellano's two sons, who were running the dial poultry business, as the chicken men, and called business advisors that Castellano had around him the Jew Club. Tommy Gambino, Don Carlo's son and Paul's nephew, who oversaw the family's interests in the garment center, was a sissy dressmaker. Chuckling at his own wit, he conjured up an image of Castellano and Bolotti spending their evenings together on Tote Hill, whacking off. The day would come, he boasted to crew members, when John would be the family boss and he, Angelo, the underboss. Wow, Mao thought. He could just imagine what Castellano's reaction would be if he ever heard talk like this. And perhaps he would. Mao briefly considered and discarded the idea of placing either a phone tap or a microphone in the Bergen clubhouse. Wise guys by now were alert to the fact that their social clubs had probably been wired. Any business being discussed was broached in basically unintelligible, fragmented sentences punctuated with hand signals or conducted on the street. This ends side two of cassette five of Underboss. Please fast forward to the end before loading cassette six. Underboss, Cassette 6 But when Ruggiero moved from his Howard Beach home in early 1982 to a new residence in suburban Cedarhurst, Long Island, the wiretap followed him. And now Jim Calstrom's team of break-in experts and highly trained technicians installed a miniature state-of-the-art bug as well. They knew exactly where to put it. Thanks to Willie Boy Johnson and other sources developed once Gotti was targeted, Mao had learned that Ruggiero held his mob meetings in a dinette off the kitchen. 
the garrulous Angelo came through. A Long Island neighbor, Robert DiBernardo, the family's porno king, would drop by, and from the constant prurient questioning by Ruggiero, Mao's squad got a very clear picture of both the extent and the profitability of what the family was raking in. Mao also learned that the serious, potentially bloody rivalry supposed by conventional wisdom to exist between Neil Della Croce and Paul Castellano was very much overblown, if it existed at all. Frank DeChico was a visitor to the dinette. Admittedly, a racketeer gangster gap existed between the boss and the underboss, and DeChico was one of the few in the family able to move easily between the two, enjoying their mutual respect. But when Ruggiero, who was a nephew of Della Croce's, tried to convince De Chico that his uncle had real beefs against Castellano, De Chico wouldn't bite. To Ruggiero's unhappiness, De Chico said that as far as he was concerned, Neil was a faithful underboss. He was old line Cosa Nostra. He knew the rules. Gene Gotti, John Carneglia, and Eddie Lino, who was yet to be made, sat at Ruggiero's dinette table. They all worked for Angelo's fugitive brother, Sal, whose heroin trafficking, they told Angelo, had brought in upwards of two million dollars in just one six-month period. From the tone of these conversations, Mao deduced that Angelo himself was not then directly involved in heroin. Then, suddenly, everything changed. On May 6, 1982, almost two months to the day after the dinette bug was activated, Sal Ruggiero died in the crash of a chartered Learjet off the Florida coast. And Angelo, as the executor of his estate, inherited his brother's drug cartel. Now the talk about heroin became quite explicit. Gene Gotti and John Carneglia would inform Angelo that they had five kilos available here, three there. This or that had to be done. The guy has already paid, Gene Gotti once said. We owe him two kilos. Other suppliers and dealers who'd been part of his brother's empire would be at the Cedarhurst house, using transparent code words like pieces of furniture or mortgage payments. In his new role as a heroin trafficker, Ruggiero exhibited an uncharacteristic wariness. He not only had law enforcement to worry about, but was well aware that Paul Castellano had repeatedly declared, you deal in drugs, you die. He brought in an ex-New York City cop to sweep his home for possible taps and bugs. As soon as Gambino's squad agents learned this, the microphone was turned off. Two days later, after the sweep had been completed, it was activated again, and the former cop was overheard telling Ruggiero, Ange, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is the house is clean. The bad news is your phone's tapped. Ruggiero could barely contain his relief. I figured that, he gushed. I knew it, I knew it. Thank God I watch myself on that fucking phone. Them motherfuckers, fuck them. Bruce Mao allowed himself a big smile. Giving up the wiretap was not much of a sacrifice. The bug was what counted. Eventually, it would provide probable cause to attempt to place a bug in Castellano's great house on the hill. One bit of intelligence gleaned from this surveillance initially surprised Mao. For all his bluster, John Gotti was deathly afraid of Castellano. When Gotti was summoned to a meeting with the boss, Mao remembered, he returned shaking like a leaf. And when one of these summonses occurred, usually out of the blue, Gotti would be ready to jump out of his skin. Now what's going on? Am I in trouble again? Upon reflection, though, Mao realized that Gotti had every reason to be terrified of Castellano. However tough the Bergen crew was, it was no match for the work crews that answered to Paul Castellano. For all of his desire to wrap himself in the mantle of a successful businessman, Castellano still commanded a huge army of stone killers, like Tommy Bellotti, Frank DeChico, Roy DeMeo, Nino Gaggi, 
a violent Irish gang called the Westies in Manhattan that Castellano used for off-the-record hits, and, of course, Sammy Gravano. But at this juncture, Sammy the Bull was nowhere on Mao's radar screen. In Ruggiero's endless chit-chat about the family, he had never once mentioned Sammy. At that time, in 82-83, I was a million miles away from the Bergen crew, Sammy said. I wasn't into drugs, into hijacking, heists, bookmaking. I was in construction. John's people, Angelo, don't know nothing about construction. I knew John did a lot of hits for Paul, and he knew I did them too. But you don't talk about them. Like Todo Orello once said, you do a hit, it's over and done with. You talk about it, and you're doing it again. And it could wind up on tape. Despite all the distractions of the Plaza Suite tax case, Sammy continued to broaden his construction interests. Besides the plumbing and drywall companies and his hardwood flooring and carpeting firm, he launched a painting company. In much the same way that the Gambino family controlled local 282 of the Teamsters, the Lucchese family controlled District Council 9 of the International Brotherhood of Painters and Allied Trades. What I do, Sammy said, is I get Dino, who is a guy with the Lucchese people, to go and bid the painting contracts for me. Dino gets the job, and I get half the profits. And Sammy also moved into steel erection for buildings. A relatively small company, Gem Steel, was run by an entrepreneur named Joseph Polito. A decent guy, a cool guy. Polito's chief engineer was Mario Mastromarino. Mario worked in steel all his life, really a top guy in his field, recognized and respected. Me and Louis Melito know Mario for a hundred years from the neighborhood and he approaches us and asks if we could help Jem on some subcontract. And we did. He comes back and says how happy Joe Polito is, and could we help out on another job he's bidding for. So eventually, me and Louis sit down with Joe and we tell him, Look, you got a couple of favors from us, and it benefited you pretty good. You're not dealing with morons here, and every once in a while you got to pass something back. Joe Polito is no fool. Okay, wonderful, he says. The kickbacks Sammy received for steering subcontracts to Jem, resolving union problems, were not huge, averaging $15,000 or $20,000. But Sammy was content to do everything he could to engender Jem Steele's growth. He had much grander plans down the line. Nor was that all. He would become the consultant to a fledgling concrete-pouring company called Marathon. Its president, of all people, was the son of Sammy's first hit, Joe Colucci. Concrete-pouring was a cash cow, and Sammy wanted in. Not a single load of concrete was poured for any contract worth more than two million dollars, which is to say, every major building project in New York City, without the assent of four of the five families. Only the Bonanno family, in disgrace because of endemic heroin trafficking at the highest levels and no longer with a seat on the commission, was out of the picture. The point man was a member of the Colombo family, Ralph Scopo, who was president and business manager for the local district council of the Cement and Concrete Workers Union. And of course, there were the Teamsters. Certain concrete-pouring contractors were allowed to be part of what was called the Concrete Club. Each of the families controlled one or more of these companies. It was the only way they could avoid sudden union problems or cutoffs in concrete deliveries. In return, there was a kickback of 2% for every contract over $2 million. With Sammy on board, Marathon was now in the club, Although being the new boy on the block and still small, the amount of work it could expect was then limited. The way the system worked was monopoly capitalism in its purest form. When bids were solicited for a project, the families decided which of the companies was up for the contract. Once the price had been determined, 
the other companies in the club were advised accordingly and instructed to put in higher bids. In Manhattan, a lion's share of concrete pouring went to two companies owned by a man named Edward J. Halloran. As a result, the cost of a cubic yard of poured concrete rose to $85, the highest in the nation. Ironically, Halloran also owned a hotel on Manhattan's Lexington Avenue where the Justice Department had negotiated a special rate for its attorneys and where John Gotti carried on many of his late-night trysts. The reckless greed of the concrete club gnawed at Sammy. It was obvious, he said. If one of them gets a contract for, say, $13 million, the next thing you know, after he knows he's got it, he jacks up the whole thing before it's over to a $16 or $17 million job. Now he's increased the cost 33%. So our greed is compounded by the greed of them so-called legitimate guys. They figure the families will be happy. They're still getting their 2%, only it's more now. And where are the general contractors, the developers, the builders going to go? It's a catch-22 for them. They'll go along to the extent that it's within reason, where nobody gets really hurt, live and let live. Everything is passed on. The guy who pays in the end is the guy buying his condo and leasing prime office space. I think only one developer, Sam Lefrac, said the hell with this and went over to Jersey. But when you're just ripping them off and shaking them down that way, it gets to be another story, and eventually that was what happened. It blew up in their faces. Sammy had witnessed similar greed with the unions. I'm in the drywall business, he said. But there was a time when there wasn't drywall. It was plaster. Understand, we use the unions as weapons. The only time we give a union an order is when a general contractor gets out of line. We don't control wages and bullshit like that. The plasterer's union got to be prima donnas. They were getting like 500 a week way back. In comes drywall, sheetrock. And the plaster went down to zip. Who the fuck uses plaster anymore? Look at the dock workers. Tony Scotto was in charge of the local. He's a capo in the Gambino family only because of his father-in-law, Tough Tony, who ran it before him. He's like royalty in the family. His wife's uncle was the Mad Hatter himself, the boss of the family, before Carlo. But Scotto ain't a tough guy. He lets that union go crazy. You want to unload a ship? You need 48 different people standing around giving orders at top wages. You got a guy on the dock for one hour? Well, you gotta pay him all day. What happened is the big shipping companies went to alternate places, to Texas, Baltimore, Jersey, Philly, you name it. Now, on the concrete, I was with Paul one time, and he was asking me what I thought. I told him we were pushing too far with this. It was too much of a lock. It's not one job, two jobs, ten jobs. It's everything in the city. Every major project in the city of New York, 100% controlled by us. And the prices keep getting inflated. The bubble is going to pop. Paul was a brilliant business guy. He already foresaw a lot of these things. He was basically agreeing with me, but he was saying that four families were involved, the whole commission, and he had to go with the flow. The money was rolling in. It had got to a point where it was so big, even Paul couldn't control it. It was because of his involvement in construction, with its carefully calibrated division of spoils, that Sammy himself came close to being the object of a sanctioned Cosa Nostra hit. Sammy and Eddie Garofala, in partnership with Joe Madonia, the original owner of Ace Partitions, continued to get most of their drywall subcontracts from Louis de Bono, a soldier in the crew of the Gambino family capo, Pat Conti. When de Bono fell some $200,000 in arrears for money's due ace, Sammy dispatched Madonia, an experienced drywall man who was not in the mob, for payment. It never occurred to Sammy that there would be a problem. De Bono, after all, was a friend of ours like Sammy. Financial trust and honesty were an unquestioned given.
But Madonia returned empty-handed. De Bono had claimed that only $50,000 was due, that there had been a lot of back work charges because he had to bring in other drywall firms to redo inferior performances by ace partitions. Madonia said that de Bono produced documents to support his position and that they were phony. Sammy's back went up at once. If there was one thing he insisted upon, however a job was obtained, it was that the work had to be top of the line. It's clear he's robbing us. Madonia said. Sammy, with Garofalo and Madonia, confronted De Bono in his office. De Bono had a lawyer and an accountant present. Waving assorted papers, he began a labored explanation of how the figure owed ace partitions had been arrived at. After listening for a few minutes, barely able to contain himself, Sammy finally ordered Madonia, Garofalo, and De Bono's representatives. Out of the office, then, leaning toward De Bono, his voice choking with rage, he said, "Shove the papers up your ass, you fat fuck! What do you think we are, suckers? Don't try robbing me. There's no way you'll ever get to enjoy the money. I'll scatter your brains all over the wall." De Bono shrank back. Sammy, we'll work this out. Sammy stormed out of the office. De Bono immediately contacted Conti. He told his capo that Sammy had grabbed him and raised his fist. That Sammy had threatened to whack him out. He wanted Conti to go to Paul Castellano and get permission to have Sammy killed. What De Bono said Sammy had done was unpardonable. It was a fundamental tenet of Cosa Nostra that one made member could never raise his hands against another. What's more, said De Bono. The charges Sammy had lodged against him were spurious. Almost at once, Castellano ordered a sit-down. Sammy knew he was in deep trouble. To make matters worse, Pat Conti was a Castellano favorite. When Castellano had sought to bring Dial's poultry products into the supermarket chains, Conti had played a key role in paving the way. Sammy told Frank De Chico that he had let his temper get the best of him. But the truth was, he didn't regret it. Look, De Chico counseled, there was only the two of you. It's your word against his. He says one thing, you say the other. You deny it. Who can prove anything? Maybe you're right, Sammy said. He respected De Chico, and the more he thought about it, the more it seemed to be really good advice. The meeting was scheduled to be held in the back of a Staten Island diner. At least Sammy figured nothing would happen there. He took Eddie Garofalo with him, but when they arrived, nobody was around. Then I saw this black Lincoln pull up with tinted windows, so you can't see in. Tommy Bellotti steps out of the Lincoln. He tells me the appointment has been changed. It's going to be in the basement of some house. Bring your brother-in-law, Tommy said. Now I can't help wondering if I'm going to come out of this fucking meeting, but I went, and I'm taking Frankie's advice very seriously. Castellano sat at the head of the table. Neil Della Croce was there, as well as the white-haired consigliere Joe N. Gallo. Tommy Bellotti took his place. Frank De Chico was present as well. Sammy saw De Bono sitting next to Conti. This fat fuck, Louis De Bono, Sammy remembered, was down there at the other end, smoking a fucking big cigar and smirking and laughing, like he's saying to me, "Now I got you by the balls." Paul Castellano addressed Sammy. He said that grave accusations had been made by a friend of ours. Sammy had raised his hands against him. Sammy had threatened to kill him. Was this true? I looked at De Bono, that smirk on his face, waiting to hear me whimper out of this, to dog it, lie. Probably everybody at the table was expecting something like that. I thought to myself, if I do that, nobody's going to know the truth. I said to myself, fuck this. Whether I die or not, I don't give a flying fuck no more. I forgot Frankie's advice. I'm not giving this guy the satisfaction. 
I went into a fucking frenzy. I just exploded. I stood up and I was yelling, yes, it's true. This fat scumbag was robbing me. He was robbing the family. I explained how he was cheating on all the paperwork. He deserved to die. I said, Paul, give me the permission and I'll kill him right here and now. There was total silence at the table, as if no one could actually believe their ears. Sammy saw Castellano pale, possibly at the thought of a hit taking place right in front of him. Conti's lips appeared to be moving, but no words were coming out. De Bono stared at Sammy, wide-eyed. The smirk had disappeared. Sammy knew that Neil Della Croce was a hoodlum of the old school, but that was about the extent of it. On occasion, he'd gone to Della Croce's club, The Ravenite, on Mulberry Street in Little Italy, to deliver a message from Tato. Once or twice he had stayed on to play pinochle with the underboss. Suddenly, his face flushed with anger, Della Croce pointed towards Sammy and bellowed, Here's a guy who's designing his death right now. But I want to tell you one thing. I listened and he's speaking the fucking truth. He ain't lying, and he could lie and try and get out of this. Maybe he did wrong, but he's right. The other one is a disgrace to our life. Finally, Castellano, having recovered from his initial astonishment at Sammy's outburst, spoke up. All right, let's take it easy. In the face-saving discussion that followed, it was decided that both sides were equally guilty of wrongdoing. It was put down as a misunderstanding all around. Sammy and De Bono were to end their business relationship. They were to shake hands, and that would be it. When Castellano demanded Sammy's promise that he would obey this edict, Sammy said, Paul, I give you my word that I'm not going to hurt him. Turning to the shaken De Bono, Castellano said, I want your word, too. But before De Bono could reply, Sammy broke in, Paul, I don't think there's any worry about him hurting me. News of what had occurred spread throughout the family. No one could recall anything remotely like it ever happening before. The word was that Sammy was on the spot and he had the balls to shoot it out. He didn't even try to hide threatening De Bono. Wise guys laughed at the thought of how Paul Castellano's knees must have been knocking under the table when Sammy wanted to whack out De Bono right in front of him. If there was any lingering doubts that Sammy was both a racketeer and a gangster, they vanished. At the Bergen Hunt and Fish Social Club, an amazed John Gotti heard about it and how his mentor, Neil Della Croce, had stood up for Sammy the Bull. Chapter 13 What Sides? I Thought We Were All One Family Based largely on evidence gathered from the microphone in Angelo Ruggiero's dinette, court authorization was obtained for a Title III bug to be placed in Castellano's Tote Hill residence. It was a daunting prospect. Not only was the mansion in a security-conscious neighborhood of million-dollar-plus homes with no parking allowed on the streets, but it was protected by the most modern alarm system, monitored by a security company minutes away that was run by a private investigator who occasionally replaced Tommy Bellotti as Castellano's driver when Bellotti was otherwise occupied. Beyond this... There were closed-circuit cameras, window sensors, sophisticated locks, watchdogs, and floodlit grounds at night. When Jim Kalstrom told his two top agents on the special operations team, John Kravick and Jim Cantamesa, what their next assignment was going to be, he recalls Kravick wisecracking, A piece of cake. When do we do it? After we finish wiring the Vatican? Two other agents on Mao's Gambino squad, assigned to keep tabs on Castellano, would later publish a book in which they described participating in a daring-do midnight break-in to place the bug, 
complete with blackened faces and black clothes, knocking out the watchdogs with drugged meat and bypassing the alarm system with only seconds to spare before it went off. In fact, none of this happened. Kalstrom's team spent weeks poring over various scenarios. Blueprints of the mansion were acquired. Informants solved the problem of where to place a bug in a house with 17 rooms. Big Paul usually conducted his mob business gatherings at a long table at one end of his vast kitchen, presumably comforted, as a former butcher, by the proximity of his cherished meat lockers. Finally, a decision was reached that the security obstacles were too great for a break-in. In addition, surveillance showed that there was hardly a predictable moment when someone living in the mansion wasn't there. A far more simple, direct approach, just as daring in its own way, was settled on. The bug was installed in broad daylight one afternoon in mid-March 1983, under the very eyes of Tommy Bellotti. Although many details of precisely how it was done remain classified, the key was Castellano's television sets. According to the memoirs of Jules Bonavolanta, who was then chief of the organized crime squads in the FBI's New York office, Castellano's home TV reception began to suffer intermittent interruptions. In frustration, he had Bellotti arrange for a service call. On the day of the appointment, Castellano had to leave for a Wall Street lunch with his financial advisors. He instructed Bellotti to shadow the serviceman everywhere he went. The serviceman was Jim Cantamesa. Down the street, in the guise of a telephone company worker, John Kravick had clamped his way up a pole. The two agents were connected by wireless radio. Bellotti showed Cantamesa all the sets in the mansion. None of them were working properly. At last, they got to one in the kitchen on a shelf by the table. Uh-uh, Cantamesa said, pointing to the baseboard. See all those cobwebs there, sir? Yeah. They can screw up an electrical connection like you wouldn't believe. Bellotti appeared dumbstruck by this revelation. No shit. So what you gotta do? Cantamesa explained that the first thing to do was to clean out the cobwebs, and next, to examine the wiring in the immediate vicinity to ascertain whether it should be replaced. Producing wires with alligator clips, he said, I can jump over the bad section here like this. Kravick on the pole immediately eliminated the TV signal interference. Unbelievable! Bellotti said. Fucking cobwebs! Who fucking knew? Cantamesa was careful to ask Bellotti if he wanted him to take care of the problem, and Bellotti urged, Yeah, yeah, do what you gotta do. Once the bug was installed, transmissions from it were relayed by repeaters to a rented room in a warehouse down the hill, where a listening post had been prepared. But all that was being received were broadcasts from an all-news radio station. Two technicians from Foreign Counterintelligence in Washington were called in. They brought equipment that even Kalstrom's team was not privy to. For about an hour, they fiddled with dials and exotic antennae, until suddenly Paul Castellano's voice was heard saying, There any more of that pie left, Gloria? Gloria was Gloria Olarte, the Castellanos' live-in Colombian maid. The book subsequently written by the two Gambino squad agents about Castellano hadn't been authorized by Washington, which may have hastened their departure from the Bureau. Among its more sensational revelations was not only that Gloria was Big Paul's mistress, but that the 68-year-old boss was impotent and had arranged for a penile implant to consummate their affair. Intimate details of Castellano's explanation to her of the procedure were published. The rod goes in, he was overheard saying, and then, zoop, it works just like a, like a gooseneck lamp. 
Sammy knew about Gloria. He had been at the mansion one afternoon with Frank DeChico when Castellano was angrily complaining that FBI agents had approached her to provide information about him. I said, Paul, do you want me to take her out? And he gives me this look. Take Gloria out, he said, and I said, yeah, if you're worried about her, let's get rid of her. Right away, Frankie started kicking me under the table. My leg was black and blue for a week. So I said, Paul, it was just a thought in case you need me. After we left, Frankie says, are you nuts? Why, what's the matter? He loves this girl. He's having an affair with her. He's gone berserk over this fucking broad. I said, Gloria? He said, yeah, Gloria. He'll kill me and he'll kill you before he kills her. Are you crazy or what? I told Frankie, how was I supposed to know? This Gloria was ugly as sin. She was fucking atrocious. She could hardly speak English. I couldn't understand it. I mean, a guy like Paul, who's got a ton of money? So get a gorgeous-looking broad. Buy a little place for her. Keep her tucked away and do what you want. It don't mean nothing. Who could figure he's going to find the ugliest one in the world and do what he was doing right in front of his own wife under the same roof? Unbelievable! And his wife, Nina, was a wonderful woman like you would want your mother to be. Years later, when Sammy learned about the penile implant, he wasn't that surprised. He recalled a time when Castellano had gone to Florida with Tommy Bellotti to avoid a subpoena. Castellano would call in every night to a public phone in a Staten Island pharmacy. One day, a son of Castellano's contacted Sammy and told him, My father wants to speak to you. On the phone, Castellano said he wanted an update on some construction projects. Could Sammy fly down just for a day? But the day stretched into three days, then four. Castellano rarely ventured out of the hotel suite he and Bellotti, and now Sammy, were sharing. And Sammy was getting stir-crazy. After Castellano had retired for the night, Sammy said to Bellotti, Let's go out for a couple of drinks, not for long. No, Sammy, we can't. What if, God forbid, something happens? I think about this for a second, Sammy remembered, and I said, You're right, Tommy. We're like security, I guess. We gotta stay here. So we're fucked. I open up the yellow pages, and there's all these escort services. I called one of them up and told them to send over two young girls, early twenties, blonde, blue eyes. Tommy's a little leery, but I said, we're in our part of the suite. How's Paul going to know? Sure enough, these two hookers come in, knockouts, really nice, sharp. When we're finished, I start thinking about Paul. Listen, I said to the girl I was with, my uncle's in the next room. I want you to knock on the door. Don't ask him no questions. Don't ask for no money. Don't ask him nothing. Just go in there and do whatever he wants you to do. I think she wanted fifty dollars, so I gave her a hundred to make sure everything goes right. Now Tommy's in a panic. What if Paul takes offense? What if he does this, and what if he does that? I said, I'll take the weight. If he don't want her, he'll throw her out. He wants to get mad, he'll get mad at me because I did it. This girl knocks on the door. It opens. She's standing there. All of a sudden, I see his hand come out and grab her by the wrist, and she goes in. I figured, so far so good. He didn't throw her out. About thirty minutes passed before she comes out. How'd it go, I asked. Did he say anything? No, he just took my arm and went back in bed and laid down. But he never got it up. I did everything I could. I guess he wasn't too excited. Then he said... You can leave, I said. That's it? That's it, she said. Now I'm thinking, my God, I'm in trouble. I'm going to get my ass chewed out big time for sending in a hooker. The weird part was that when we all went down for breakfast in the morning, Paul never said one fucking word. It was like it didn't happen. Afterwards, Tommy gave me a little hint that maybe Paul had a problem and to forget it. Personally, I thought it was nauseating for the agents to put all that stuff in their book. Paul was long gone by then, but it was humiliating to the man's memory.
Although Paul Castellano had run the most powerful Cosa Nostra family in the nation for seven years, since 1976 he'd remained practically unknown to the public at large and seemingly immune to prosecution. But now the layers of insulation he'd enjoyed were beginning to fray. The Gambino squad agents made no attempt to hide their physical surveillance. Then, quite apart from the squad, just as Kalstrom's team was looking at various ways to bug Castellano's house, a combined federal, state, and city task force was zeroing in on a huge auto theft ring headed up by a family soldier named Roy DeMeo. DeMeo's capo was Nino Gaggi, in whose house Castellano had been officially confirmed as the new family boss while Della Croce settled for his old role as underboss. Sammy knew DeMeo very well. Roy was a tremendous earner, and he was as dangerous as you can get, he said. Paul used him for a lot of hits, on and off the record. I was in a diner with him once talking about stolen cars. There was a whole bunch of senior citizens eating in there, minding their own business. All of a sudden, for no reason at all, right in the middle of our conversation, he says that with a couple of nine millimeters, he could blow them all away before they knew what was happening. I remember thinking, I've killed people myself, but a room full of senior citizens? What kind of insanity is this? During one nine-month period, DeMeo's ring shipped 351 stolen vehicles to the Middle East, principally to Kuwait, at an average profit per car of $5,000. Castellano, of course, knew few of the details of how the ring operated, or about the 25 murders associated with it. Stealing cars was beneath him, but he didn't turn his back on the money. DeMeo handed over roughly $20,000 a week to his capo, Gaggi, who every Sunday would then deliver an indeterminate amount of cash, wads of hundred-dollar bills, to Tote Hill. Although the Gambino squad was after much bigger game, this was just the kind of Rico case that G. Robert Blakey had envisioned. DeMeo, a participating member of a criminal enterprise, and Castellano, the overall head of that enterprise, who had reaped illicit proceeds from a pattern of racketeering, whether or not he was personally involved in it. Castellano was perfectly aware of the pitfalls. To make matters worse, from his standpoint, De Mayo had also become a heavy dealer and user of cocaine. His behavior was increasingly erratic. This made him even more dangerous. Then Frankie De Chico told me that Paul had ordered a hit on Roy. Frankie's crew was given the contract. They couldn't get to him, so Frankie used two guys who were with Roy. He told them that this was what the boss wanted, and they did it. I understood why Frankie tipped me when I was up seeing Paul a day or two afterwards. He had me sit down. That girl, Gloria, got me coffee, and Paul threw down a newspaper in front of me. It was open to a page. Here, read this, he said, walking all around. The story was about Roy DeMeo being found in the trunk of a car. What do you think of that, he said. He don't know that I know that he gave the order. He's being devious. He wants to see my feelings, like maybe I would say, Hey, Roy was my best friend. I'm going to get even with whoever the fuck did this. He's trying to gauge my reaction. So what I did, as soon as I got done reading the article, I looked at him and said, Paul, if you're mad, I'm mad. If you ain't mad, I said, putting the paper aside, I don't give a fuck. He looked at me and said, Oh, all right. You want something else with the coffee? Those were his exact words, and it was over and done with. I guess he was happy with that answer. Far more serious clouds hovered on Castellano's horizon. In August 1983, about six months after DeMeo's murder, four months after Big Paul's kitchen was bugged, the Gambino squad arrested Angelo Ruggiero, Gene Gotti, 
John Carneglia, and eight other men associated with the Bergen crew for heroin racketeering. For the first time, it was revealed that much of the evidence was obtained via the bug in Ruggiero's Cedarhurst home. Since death was the family's official position on drug dealing, the garrulous, hulking Ruggiero took the only option available to him. Through John Gotti and Neil Della Croce, he sent messages denying everything. It was a bullshit case, he insisted. The feds didn't really have anything on him. He even went so far as to say that if the FBI had tapes, it wasn't his voice on them. It was all a sham, a frame. He wasn't into drugs. The feds were just trying to tie him in with his late brother, Sal. Paul Castellano elected to proceed with some caution. This case involved not one or two renegade soldiers, but for all practical purposes, the entire Bergen crew, one of the family's key work crews, with the notable exception, so far, of its acting capo, John Gotti. He could break John down to a soldier on the grounds that he'd failed to control the crew and disband what was left of it. But there was Neil Della Croce to consider. Della Croce hadn't displayed the slightest sign of disloyalty to the precepts of Cosa Nostra. Still, there was a lingering uncertainty in Castellano's head about Della Croce. As boss and underboss, their relationship was unusual. They had little in common. If Paul was into white-collar organized crime, Neil was his blue-collar hoodlum equivalent. The truth was that Paul had accepted Neil as underboss simply to smooth over a potentially tense confrontation that might have prevented his coronation as boss. He knew that Della Croce was an immensely popular figure in the family, and that not only was John Gotti extremely close to him, but Ruggiero was his nephew. This ends Side 1 of Cassette 6. Please turn the cassette over and start Side 2 at the same point. Castellano never hesitated to employ violence when it served his immediate purpose. He was not, however, as Sammy said, an instinctive gangster. To back the Bergen crew into a corner was to invite civil war. Castellano had seen how persistent blood-soaked warfare in the Colombo family, beginning with the assassination of Joe Colombo and continuing on through the lengthy imprisonment of Carmine Persico, was tearing that family apart. At this stage of his life, it was the last thing Castellano desired. He loved the money being boss brought him, but he'd begun to detest the job itself. And, of course, he had no idea that the electronic surveillance of Ruggiero had led to the bug in his own residence. Della Croce, playing for time on behalf of his nephew as well as Gotti, provided Paul with a face-saving way out. Look, Neil told him, sooner or later the government's got to turn over them tapes. Let's see what's on them. Then the Gambino squad's Bruce Mao learned that Ruggiero had already started playing another high-stakes card. At the request of the FBI's Colombo squad, Jim Kallstrom's team had bugged a table in a Brooklyn restaurant where the family's acting boss in the absence of Persico, Gennaro Jerry Lang Langella, and one of his top captains, Dominic Donny Shacks Montemarano, regularly met. One memorable night, Angelo Ruggiero joined them. Lang and Shax were furious about $50,000 due them in extortion money on a construction project, which Paul Castellano had convinced the Cosa Nostra Commission to nullify. Ruggiero seized the moment. He said his uncle was disgusted with Castellano's construction interests. I can't believe it, he quoted, Della Croce is saying. That's all he talks about. Money, money, money. Big trouble was brewing between his uncle and Castellano, said Ruggiero. I think Paul's looking to whack Neil. He said that he had told Della Croce, Why don't you just do it and forget about it? Go in and fucking smoke him. Jerry Lang interjected to Donnie Shacks. What did I say, Donnie, after the holidays? What would happen? that Neil and John Gotti will die. It's getting worse and worse, too, Ruggiero said bitterly. 
Paul don't know what it's like to be on the street without a quarter in your pocket. He ain't gonna get away with it no more, Lang said. I tell you, Ange, somebody's gonna... Before Lang could finish, Ruggiero said, I know. Believe me, Jerry, I know. Listening to this, Bruce Mao remarked to Kallstrom, I don't think we're the only problem Paul has to worry about. I liked Angelo, Sammy said. He had a lot of balls. Not too much in the brains department, but he seemed then like an upfront guy. He caused a lot of people a lot of heartaches with his mistakes, his actions, everything he was doing. He was crude, but he was funny with his crudeness. He could make you laugh. So I kind of liked him. I didn't know till later that the bug on him gave the government the okay, the right legally, to bug Paul's house. It was Angie's big mouth. I mean, he's caught on tape all over the fucking place. His tapes, the tape with Jerry Lang and Donnie Shacks, you name it, and Angie's on tape. And always talking about stuff that he ain't supposed to be even mentioning to nobody. We find out about the tapes on Angie when he was arrested. And they eventually would become a major fucking problem. Ultimately, people would say these tapes and what was on them probably led to Paul's downfall. But what really led to it was also a lot of things he was doing that people in the family were against. And when the time came, when it came down to the wire, this was why me and Frankie DeChico and the other guys went along with it. Right then, though, Angie's tapes had nothing to do with me whatsoever. I was never at Angie's house. I'm not on any of his tapes in any way, shape, or form. That was all Angie's problem, John Gotti's problem, and Paul's. Meanwhile, the tapes from the bug near Castellano's kitchen table kept rolling, slowly building court admissible evidence that he was indeed the chairman and chief executive officer of a huge criminal enterprise. Among those in attendance at the table were his consigliere, Joe N. Gallo, Tommy Gambino, an aging trusted capo, Joe, Joe Piney Armone, James, Jimmy Brown, Phila, the porno king, Robert de B. de Bernardo, as always, Tommy Bellotti, occasionally Frank de Chico, along with a crafty associate in his crew, Joe, Joe the German, Watts, whose father was actually a Welshman, and Joe, Joe Butch, Corral, a capo who used the freezers of a Mulberry Street restaurant he owned to store cash deposits and withdrawals for his loan sharking. Corral was of special interest to both Castellano and the Gambino squad. The mother-in-law of one of Corral's soldiers was a deputy clerk in the federal court for the Southern District of New York, which included Manhattan. The bug revealed that she was regularly passing on inside information to Corral on what investigations were underway, what indictments were being presented to grand juries. This was how Big Paul, to his dismay, learned in early 1984 that despite the murder of Roy DeMeo, he was going to be charged in the Southern District along with nine surviving members of DeMeo's ring on 78 counts of car theft, 25 killings, cocaine dealing, extortion, prostitution, and racketeering. Castellano's lawyers assured him that the charges he faced were a reach that no jury would buy, an opinion Bruce Mao's agents privately shared. But as Mao reminded them, it's not our call. Mao was just happy that the Title III court applications he had made to bug Ruggiero, Castellano, and others were not in Manhattan, but in the Eastern District of New York, which embraced Brooklyn and Queens. And there had been no leaks. Singularly absent on any of the tapes that recorded the gatherings around Castellano's kitchen table was Neil Della Croce, and he was never spotted in any of the cars entering and exiting the Tote Hill mansion. Nor was the voice of Sammy Gravano ever heard. Although Mao was unaware of it at the time, Castellano preferred to hash over the construction projects so dear to his heart during one-on-one -on -one meetings that did not take place at the kitchen table. Each of these meetings was usually with Robert DiBernardo, 
who in addition to his porno responsibilities was Paul's emissary to local 282 of the Teamsters. With Frank DeChico, with a sallow little family soldier named Funzi Mosca, who served as Castellano's construction bagman and his expert on union jurisdiction, and with Sammy. Still, the constant physical surveillance finally landed Sammy on Mao's Gambino family chart. Ever cautious, Sammy had made it a point to go to Tote Hill in a car registered to Jem Steele. Neither Joe Polito, Jem's president, nor Mario Mastro Marino, his chief engineer, the assumed occupants of the car, appeared to be mobbed up. Then one afternoon, a car with New Jersey plates was noted. A check showed it to be registered to a horse farm. The owner of the farm was a Deborah Gravano. A further check showed that she was married to Salvatore Gravano, a maid member in Toto Aurello's crew. Years ago, he'd been acquitted in a double homicide case. He was currently embroiled in a tax evasion case that involved the sale of a Brooklyn disco. That was it. He didn't seem very important. Whenever the topic of construction came up in Castellano's kitchen, it concerned reported disputes between families, which one was entitled to what on shared projects. Paul would promptly table the discussion for further review in what were called mini-commission meetings outside the mansion, which required the attendance of the bosses involved. Sammy was present at one of them, where he got his first close-up look at Vincent the Chin Giganti in action. Although fat Tony Salerno, almost a caricature of an old line hoodlum with his cap and baggy pants, his teeth invariably clenching the stub of a cigar, his undershirt peeking above his unbuttoned collar, was listed on FBI charts and reported in the press as the boss of the Genovese family. Giganti was the real power. Family members were under strict orders never to breathe his name in passing on his wishes. They were simply to point to their own chins when referring to him. Some three decades earlier, he'd gained fame in a bungled attempt to assassinate Frank Costello on the orders of Vito Genovese. Now, residing in his aged mother's Greenwich Village apartment, he had achieved even greater notoriety in the tabloids for wandering around neighborhood streets unwashed and unshaven, attired in pajamas, a tattered robe and worn slippers, muttering incomprehensibly to himself. Time after time, psychiatrists, both his own and court-appointed, had persuaded judges that he was mentally unfit to stand trial. As an ex-prize fighter, they said, he'd taken too many punches to the head. They called them mini-commission meetings, Sammy said, because they weren't really to talk about Cosa Nostra. It was to talk about the construction business. Paul loved them because in his heart he was a businessman. There was a million bullshit problems in construction all the time. What contractor should get the bid on the concrete? Your guy got it last time out. We should get it now. How big were the Teamsters in this one, the laborers in that one? Where's the jurisdiction? Who got in on the ground floor? Paul ate that up. He loved that shit. Paul was smart as they come. The chin was more of a gangster, but I would say he was right up there with Paul. And he was pissed. He said that commission meetings should be just about family business, not the construction business or any other business. These things should be handled by captains and never even reach the commission level and have to be straightened out by bosses. The chin said, what are we doing at these fucking meetings, sitting around talking about bullshit, talking about construction? Does that require this? What if we were taking a surveillance? We're going to end up paying the piper for these meetings. He said that a commission meeting is meant to take a life or to save a life, to prevent a war between one family and another, to set overall policy. It wasn't to resolve whether you should pay this guy 5000 because he belongs to that union. That was for the captains to decide, not the bosses. The chin made some good points. I had to agree. He didn't sound so crazy to me. After his indictment in connection with DeMeo's murderous auto theft ring, 
Paul Castellano grew visibly more tense and withdrawn. It didn't seem like he was guilty, Sammy said, but that doesn't mean nothing. That don't mean you're going to win the case because you're not guilty. They've got him hornswoggled into a lot of things that he didn't know about, but he's got a problem. He did take the money, and he was using Roy for hits all over the place. For Sammy, Castellano's efforts to find out what was on the Ruggiero tapes remained a matter that did not concern him. Still, other incidents were causing him to take a second look at the family boss. There's this Eddie Garofalo, Sammy said. He's in demolition work and also construction. He gets a major job and he wants it non-union. So he comes to me and I hook him up with Louis Giardino and Local 23, which is the Mason tenders. Now Garofalo was going to make a couple of hundred thousand out of this. I told him that he has to kick back 120. He agrees. When the first 40 comes in, I told Giardino, Paul gets the whole 40. He's the boss. Let him get paid first. And that's what we do. The next 40 comes in and I think, what the hell? We use the union. It's our union. And Louis is a friend of ours. Let him do what he's got to do with the union. I don't take a penny. I can wait. That whole 40 to Louis and the union. Before I know it, the job's almost done. I still don't have the last payment, my 40. One day I went to Eddie and said, when are you coming up with the fucking 40? He said, I came up with it last week, Sammy. I gave it to Louis Giardino. I was taken aback, but I don't show any reaction. I sent for Giardino and I said, Eddie gave you 40,000 last week? And he said, yeah, that's right. Well, what did you do with it? That's my fucking 40. He said, I gave it to Paul. You gave it to Paul. Oh, all right. No problem. I'll get it off Paul. So I go up to Paul's house. Frankie DeChico's there. I'll never forget this. I went in and it's, hey, Paul, hi, Frankie. How's it going, buddy? Then I said, Paul, I believe Louis Giardino gave you 40 last week. That was mine. You were paid, and the union was paid. All of a sudden, he whispers, Shh! And he looked up at the ceiling like there were a hundred bugs in it. He said, Don't bring it up to me anymore. I'll bring it up to you. There wasn't anything more I could say. There was some talk about this and that. When I leave the house, Frankie's with me. He's laughing. Gee, Sammy, he said, you're so fucking dumb. What the fuck you talking about, dumb, I said. He said, this guy gets his hands on money. He never gives it back. He's never bringing up that 40 again. I said, are you nuts, Frankie? He's got a trillion dollars. I gave him his end first. I paid the union second. I waited for my end. You mean to tell me he's keeping my end? Frankie said, I tell you what, a steak dinner, he never brings it up. We shook hands. It's a bet. Well, I bought Frankie the steak dinner. I couldn't believe it. That bum kept the 40000 never brought it up, never said nothing. It was as if Castellano, beset by the unrest brewing in his own family, was seeking allies in other families. We had this captain up in Connecticut, Sammy said. I think his name was Frank Piccolo. The Genovese people hated him because he was their competition. They, Chin, come up with some concocted story about how he was a thorn in their side, a real pain in the ass. That's all I heard. They want permission from Paul to kill him, and he gives it, and they do kill him. For being a thorn in their side and a pain in the ass? He was doing his job for our family. He was doing what he was supposed to do. And Paul gave him up, a captain and our family, in two seconds against every Cosa Nostra rule. It was a big disgrace for the family, a real black eye. You give him up in five minutes to the Genovese family? Would you want your father giving you up like that? That was a bad, bad move Paul made.
a real bad move. You want to know your boss is going to fight for you, tooth and nail. But now you're not so sure anymore. Probably he thought it was a good move business-wise or racketeering-wise. But gangsters don't think like that. The Chin would never do that. Nobody fucked with him. He ran a tight ship, and he ain't interested in the money. He already had a ton of money. His biggest problem was where to hide it. He didn't take money from most of his captains. I guess he didn't want some captain to flip and say, I've been giving him money. But it was clear as a bell that he was the boss. So why was he doing his nut act? Sometimes I would think that he really was crazy and took medication when he had to be sane. People told me he could have dirt on him that got so dirty it wasn't like dirt, but turned kind of crusty white. Maybe our life was the only life he had. Maybe he enjoyed driving the feds nuts, which he was. Worse yet, it became apparent to Sammy, DeChico, and others that Big Paul was lining his pockets with proceeds that should have been shared with members of the Gambino family. He gave away the Bread Association, which was ours, to the Colombo family, Sammy said. I don't know what he got on that, and he started being real greedy with the concrete. What he did was to hook up with Vinny Donapoli of the Genovese family. Vinny's a tremendously smart guy and a good mover in construction. And he lets Vinny have Biff Halloran to handle. Halloran's got transit mix and certified industries, two of the biggest concrete suppliers in the city. We used to control Halloran, and we hear Vinny is bringing suitcases of money to Paul. I remember one day Frankie DeChico saying to me, Hey, Sammy, what's this? Why don't he stick somebody in our family in the middle of this thing? We got soldiers who are broke. And he got his son-in-law to go partners with Nicoletta of SNA, who's also with Vinny. So when we're dictating to the concrete club, a lot of the jobs, most of them, went to SNA. Now, I ain't a captain yet, but I was a made guy. I own a business. I'm getting small jobs, but these guys Paul made deals with are getting the bulk of everything. So that's another big mistake Paul is making. We can see he's not doing this for our family. He's doing it for his personal family, for his personal pocket. This is when the grumbling, so to speak, really starts with us, and we're talking to one another. I don't know why Paul thought that we would never talk to each other. John Gotti, who's got his own thing with Paul about Angie's tapes, picks this up, of course. At a pre-Christmas gathering at Tote Hill in 1984, Sammy arrived with the requisite envelope of money. He stayed for a short while and then said he had to leave. Paul asked him where he was going. I want to stop by the Ravenite and pay my respects to Neil. What are you going down there for? You're on my side. Sammy looked at Castellano and said, What sides? I thought we're all one family. Neil's our underboss. Chapter 14 We talked about sending a crew right into Paul's house. Across America, 1985 was not a vintage year for Cosa Nostra. Family bosses in Cleveland, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Kansas City were convicted and received lengthy sentences for conspiring to skim vast sums of cash from the Las Vegas casinos that they controlled through the use of Teamster pension funds. For all practical purposes, the mob was through in the city of dreams. The hierarchy of the Patriarcha family, which operated out of Boston and Providence, was convicted on multiple RICO counts ranging from loan sharking to murder. An all-out federal assault was launched against the Philadelphia family, which would lead to life in prison for its violent boss, Nicky Scarfo. In New Orleans, the family had never recovered from the conviction for trying to bribe a federal judge of the previously untouchable Carlos Marcello, who was often rumored to have been involved in an assassination plot against President John F. Kennedy. In Tampa, Buffalo, 
Los Angeles, and San Francisco, San Jose, the families were wobbling on their last legs. And in New York, the Manhattan U.S. attorney, Rudolph Giuliani, announced the ultimate RICO racketeering case against Cosa Nostra, charging that the commission itself was a criminal enterprise. All five local bosses or acting bosses would be indicted. Among them, the Colombo acting boss, Jerry Langella, Anthony Tony Dux Corallo, the Lucchese boss, Phil Rusty Restelli, the Bonanno boss, the Genovese boss, Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the Colombo boss, Carmine Persico, and Paul Castellano. Only Chin Giganti escaped unscathed. While he was the true power in his family, Salerno was the ostensible boss. Giganti had never been caught on tape, no one in the family had incriminated him by name on tape, and the reality was that prosecutors also faced the uninviting prospect of trying to prove that he possessed the mental competence to stand trial. The bail set for Castellano, who was described as the de facto head of the commission, was the highest for any of the defendants. Four million dollars. After a night in jail, he had no trouble meeting it. Now Paul learned for the first time that his home had been bugged and that the Ruggiero tapes were the legal basis for it. Give me those tapes, Big Paul demanded of Della Croce in June 1985. Transcripts weren't good enough. It was an article of faith among wise guys that at worst the government doctored them and at best made transcribing errors. But the dynamics of the play had dramatically changed. Della Croce was terminally ill with inoperable cancer. His scheduled hospital stays for treatment allowed Kallstrom's team to place a bug in his Staten Island home that recorded the conversations. Della Croce tried to placate Big Paul, saying that there were many personally embarrassing moments on the tapes that Angie did not want anyone to hear. Tell him, Castellano snapped back, not to worry about that, all right? Don't worry. I don't want these tapes in order to get the proof I need to kill him. I want these tapes because it's part of my case. He said his lawyers were trying to suppress the introduction of his own tapes in the commission trial. That was why he had to have them. Let me talk to him, Della Croce said. His voice sounded weary. In ensuing sessions between Ruggiero, Gotti, and Della Croce, Ruggiero remained adamant about not giving up the tapes. He accused his uncle of betrayal for even entertaining the thought. He told his lawyers he would kill them if they gave up the tapes. Listening to this, Bruce Mao could appreciate Ruggiero's dilemma. He was truly between a rock and a hard place. Besides narcotics trafficking, Ruggiero had prattled on about commission meetings to one of his heroin dealers, who was not then a made member. If that ever got out, nothing could save him. You don't understand, Cosa Nostra, Della Croce said, as though addressing a recalcitrant child. Gotti, anxious to maintain his standing with Neil, chimed in, Ange, what does Cosa Nostra mean? Before Ruggiero could reply, Della Croce said, Cosa Nostra means that the boss is your boss. If Ruggiero didn't give up the tapes, he warned, the likely outcome would be war in the family. Both Gotti and Ruggiero protested that that was the last thing they wanted. The tone was quite different afterward at Gotti's club, which the FBI had finally decided to bug. Fuck Paul, John Gotti told Angela. We heard about this, Sammy said. How Angie, never face to face, always through Neil, was telling Paul to go fuck himself. I don't think Neil had any great love for Paul. But first of all, Paul was the boss. You can't kill the boss. That's the rule. And Neil was for our life. I don't think if he lived, he would have let Angelo get killed. He would have probably put him on a shelf somewhere and appease Paul that way. If he let Paul kill him, there would have been a war. I think he felt 
Paul's the boss, so let's fess up. This is the truth. This is what happened. Here are the tapes. Then, if Paul followed up and said, well, I want him dead, Neil would have fought tooth and nail to save him. And if he couldn't, who knows what the fuck would have happened. But that's all hypothetical. I'm just guessing. I don't think John really gave a fuck about Angelo or the tapes. I think he was looking to create a situation to capitalize on our other grievances about Paul. I think John did give a fuck when Neil died, which we all knew would happen sooner or later. He's looking ahead, and he sees trouble. Even if he isn't killed himself, all of John's sights on being Mr. Big Shot are crippled. Paul is already talking about when Neil dies, he's going to close down the Ravenite. He's going to break John down to a soldier, stick him somewhere in a crew, maybe under Joe Butch, and treat him like a fucking hard-on. Without even being dead, he's finished. Then there is the possibility they would move on John and kill him. I mean, if tapes come out about drugs, even though it's a bullshit rule, what are you going to say? I lied? That I was kidding on the fucking tapes? Hey! It's your voices, maybe it's not John's, but all of his guys, including his brother, Angie, and everybody. So he could be finished all around, no question about it. A lot of people would jump on the bandwagon with this stuff. Plenty of guys really disliked John. It was common knowledge that Tony Ducks hated him. On the other hand, he did have a large crew, a work crew, and you know you couldn't just disregard that. Only one thing was certain. John wasn't going nowhere without Frankie DeChico and me. While this imbroglio raged on, Sammy, that summer of 1985, had more immediate concerns. He was in the middle of the Plaza Suite tax evasion case and was bracing himself for a long sentence. Everyone, including his own lawyer, thought he was going to be convicted. By then, he had a new headquarters for his construction consulting company, S&G, a two-story building on Stillwell Avenue between Bensonhurst and Coney Island. It was in his wife's name. In fact, she had bought it, and he bore the expense of remodeling it. Deborah had been successfully dabbling in real estate, and she banked everything she made. And she boasted a winning ticket in the New York State Weekly Lottery. Sammy had seen her penciling in the numbers on a lottery slip and couldn't resist needling her about it. That's only for suckers, he said. What are the odds? Thirteen million to one? The next night, when he arrived home, she waved the ticket at him. Say hello to a sucker, she said. It was worth eight hundred thousand dollars. Sammy held twenty-five percent of the stock in S&G. The other 75% was in Deborah's name for her and the children. She also purchased the home where they now resided, in a middle-class neighborhood in mid-Staten Island, convenient to the expressway that led to the Verrazano Bridge in Brooklyn. Once again, Sammy was responsible for the renovations, which turned out to be a massive reconstruction. On a corner plot, it was a run-down wooden frame house. By the time Sammy was finished, it was brick with marble floors, the original 2,300 square feet nearly doubled, with an in-ground pool in the backyard, all surrounded by a 16-foot-high wall. The Union construction crews were quite cooperative. One day in late September 1985, Robert DiBernardo brought a message to Sammy. Could he go to Queens? Angelo and John would like to see him. So I went, Sammy said. But only Angie was there. He said, Sammy, we're going to make a move. I'm making a move on Paul. Are you with me? I remember him hitting himself on the chest and saying, I'm going to blow this fucking motherfucker away. I'm listening, not saying anything. Then I said, Ange, let me ask you a couple of questions. Where's John? He's with me, Sammy. But he thought it was best for me and you to talk first. So already John was playing the big shot. I said, 
Where's Frank DeChico on this? We're going to get to Frankie, and Frankie's going to be with us. You'll see. So right this minute, Frankie don't know what you're telling me? No. I said, Angie, I'm not going to tell you what my position is, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm getting in my car, and I'm going to see Frankie myself and tell him about this meeting we're having now. You got any problem with that? No, no. Go ahead and tell him. Come on, Sammy, I love you and Frankie. I need you. You know I'm dead without you. I went over to Frankie's house and rang the bell. For me, Frankie's an awesome guy. His crew is double mine, Tato's, and everybody loves him. He's about six foot, big, tough, muscular, nose a little smashed over to one side. His father's a made guy. His uncle George right now is a captain. Another uncle's not made, but a street guy nonetheless. I said, Frankie, come on out, let's take a walk. I gotta have a long talk with you. And I tell him what's going on, what Angie said. All right, Sammy, what do you think? He said. I said, Frankie, what do I think? That's why I'm here. What do you think? What do we think together? I mean, as boss, Paul's selling the family out. Both Sammy and DeChico were acutely aware that what was being suggested was practically unheard of. There hadn't been an unsanctioned hit on a family boss in New York since Vito Genovese's botched murder attempt against Frank Costello nearly 30 years ago. I said, I guess the point is, should we let John and Angie fight it out with Paul? Should we stay on the sidelines? Just sit back? Or should we join in? We bounced everything off each other for two, three hours, whatever it was, and we concluded that we're not laid-back guys. We were really going to oppose this, or we're going to approve it. And if we approve it, we would join in. Then Frankie said, Neil's not long for this world, and Paul may go up on these cases he has. If he does, the word is he's making Tommy Gambino the acting boss and Tommy Bellotti the underboss. I had heard some of this already, and it made me sick. Tommy Gambino was a fucking dressmaker. I went one time to the garment district to see him about something, and there he was on his knees pinning the hem on some model. How does that look to you, Sammy, he said. Isn't it beautiful? And Tommy Bellotti's a fucking abusive gorilla. We're going to have to answer to them. They're going to run our family. We keep talking, and finally we decide we'll back the move, be part of it. Then I told Frankie, the only thing I want is that you become the boss after this is over. That's when Frankie said, John's fucking ego is too big. I could be his underboss, but he couldn't be mine. Look, he's got balls, he's got brains, he's got charisma. If we can control him to stop the gambling and all his flamboyant bullshit, he could be a good boss. Sammy, I'll tell you what, we'll give him a shot. Let him be the boss. If it don't work out within a year, me and you, we'll kill him. I'll become the boss, and you'll be my underboss, and we'll run the family right. Let's give him the shot. I said, Frankie, if that's the way you feel, that's good enough for me. And we shook hands on it. The next day, we sent for Angie, both of us, to come to Frankie's club. We told him, we're with you. We need a series of meetings. And when you come down again, come with John. He's no big shot here. If John don't come down for the next meeting, we retract this. We won't be with you. We'll be against you if you go ahead and make the hit. John is at the next meeting. Angelo's there. I'm there. Frankie. Debye is there, too. No phones are being used. Debye is our messenger back and forth, the in-between guy. He's giving us information about Paul. Besides the porno stuff, Debye is Paul's main guy with the Teamsters, Local 282. He's involved in some of these conversations in the beginning stages. Then we exclude him because he's not a hit guy. He's an earner, but he's got no crew, no strength and power. We ask John what about the old-timers, 
And John says he spoke with Joe Piney, Joe Armone, a captain who's very respected in the family. He handles the restaurant unions for Paul, the entertainment business, stuff like that. John says he's on the bandwagon. And he says Joe Piney has talked to Joe Gallo, Paul's consigliere. Joe Gallo is not on the bandwagon. He don't oppose it. If we do it, he'll go along. He's not going to be part of it. In case it backfires, he's in the clear. Okay, he wants to be a fox. Let him. Me and Frankie want to make sure that Joe Piney said what John said he said about Joe Gallo. We make an appointment with him to meet us in the basement setup Joe Watts had in his house. We want to hear this out of his mouth, not John's mouth, not Angie's mouth. John and Angie are there. We send Joe Watts outside, and Frankie says to Joe Piney, You know what you're here for? Of course. Frankie starts to ask Piney about Gallo when John jumps in and Frankie said, Please, John, let me do the talking now. Then he says, We understand you have Joe Gallo. Yeah, I spoke to him. He won't be part of the move. His name can't be mentioned. But he will go along if we take over. Sammy remembered how DeChico stared at Joe Piney Armone and asked how sure he was that Gallo wouldn't tip off Paul. The 67-year-old soft-spoken capo with his horn-rimmed glasses replied, If he betrays us or he backs up one inch, I'll kill him. Well, that was good enough for us. Frankie told him, We don't need you up front. We need you after the fact to appease some of the old-timers in the family. The next consideration was the reaction of the other families. Ruggiero reported his meeting at the Casa Storta restaurant with Jerry Lang and Donnie Shacks of the Columbos. Even more recently, they had said, What's John waiting for? To go to his own funeral? Gotti boasted that he had Joe Messino, the underboss of the Bonanno family, in his hip pocket. The family was still denied a seat on the commission because of its drug trafficking. Chances of reclaiming it would be greatly improved with Castellano out of the way. As for the Lucchese family, Tony Dux Corallo not only hated Castellano, but was immersed in preparing his defense in the forthcoming commission trial. Each suffered a particular humiliation. The New York State Organized Crime Task Force had successfully placed a bug in the Jaguar of Corallo's driver. Corallo had not only chatted in the car about commission meetings, but also made sneering comments about his fellow bosses, including Castellano. One member of the Lucchese family, however, was a force to be reckoned with. Anthony Gaspipe Castle. Gaspipe was tough, Sammy said. But like with everybody, Frankie got along good with Gaspipe, and he sounded him out in a roundabout way how he felt about Paul and suppose he wasn't the boss no more. Frankie said Gaspipe told him he didn't give a fuck about Paul. So we figured we had tacit approval there. If he ever tried to do anything later, we could throw that in his face. The plotters concluded that the Genovese family was the only one that would not be approached. Big Paul and the Chin went back too far. They were too tight, Sammy said. They had all their big money arrangements. So we decided, fuck Chin. If it comes down to it, we'll go to war with them. And we decided when we take down Paul, we got to take out Tommy Bellotti. They must go together. Everybody agrees to that 100%. This ends side two of cassette six of Underboss. Please fast forward to the end before loading cassette seven. Underboss, cassette seven. That autumn, Castellano's lawyer, James La Rossa, at last obtained the Ruggiero tapes on behalf of his client. Upon learning this, Bruce Mao couldn't help thinking that with Della Croce on the verge of death, it was kill or be killed for John Gotti. There were more meetings. We had to think ahead, Sammy said. 
Okay, after Paul and Tommy go down, what happens? We could have to hit the mattresses. We could be in the midst of a fucking war. Let's make a list and see who else we have to take out, who we think is a potential threat, who's going to be a problem. Maybe there's some Gambino family members who ain't going to be too happy. There's Paul's personal family and Tommy Bellotti's brother Joe. Greaseball hit guys from Sicily could be brought over. We believe there's a real good chance the Chin and the Genovese family will come at us. I mean, this is some massive guy we're taking out with massive connections, and we're breaking the golden rule. We could be looking at a war that could take eight, ten years. On December 2nd, Neil Della Croce died. And the plotters received an unexpected bonus. Paul Castellano did not attend either his wake or his funeral. Shock reverberated through the Gambino family at this stunning breach of respect. Because of the DeMeo racketeering case, Castellano explained, he couldn't afford the bad publicity that his presence might engender. No one bought this. Holed up in his mansion every night, consumed by his own judicial problems, he appeared to have no conception of the contempt he was being held in. Even before this, we decided we had to split up and go underground, Sammy said. If there was a leak, somebody had to survive and keep playing. Frankie said him and me would move into Joe Watts's basement. Joe and his wife and kids would stay upstairs. John and Angie could do what they wanted. I told Debbie I had to leave for a while, maybe for weeks, maybe months, years. Don't ask. I don't know how long. Nobody in my crew knows anything except old man Peruta. We stayed in contact with John and Angie using certain phone numbers. But all we said was, we'll meet at three at our friend's house, or I'll see you by the park, whatever. One idea was to have Joe Watts tell his wife that he wanted his house painted, and we would put up plastic on the walls and everything. Early in the morning, Joe Watts would reach out for Tommy Bellotti and have him come to the house. Joe would open the door for Tommy and walk him into this corridor. I would be by the first archway, where they would pass me. Frankie would be at the other archway. As Tommy went by me, I would step out and shoot Tommy in the head. Frankie would go up to Paul's and tell him Tommy had called. He was sick, so Frankie would be Paul's driver that day and then take him out. We kicked that around. What if Paul don't want to come out? What if this? What if that? It was too haphazard. We talked about sending a crew right into Paul's house. We don't mind killing the maid if she was there, after all the heartache she caused Paul's wife. But what if his family was there? We would never kill his wife, his daughter, any of the kids around. We're ripping our hair out on how to put this together properly. Now, the Roy DeMeo thing has started, and we know that Tommy Bellotti picks up Paul, and they go to this diner in Brooklyn. They eat breakfast, they sit at the same table, near the back, near the men's room, every single day, and then go to court in Manhattan. We conclude that old man Peruta, who Frankie knows and I vouch for with my life, could go into the diner. Paul don't know him. Tommy don't know him. Peruta could walk right past them to the men's room. In there, he would put on a ski mask and come out with two guns. They'd be sitting there and Peruta would just blaze away. The rest of us would be outside, inside, surrounding the place, backing up Peruta. But De Chico reported that Castellano had sent him a message to be at a meeting. Among others who would be present, according to De Chico, were Tommy Bellotti, the capos Tommy Gambino and Jimmy Brown, and a Gambino soldier named Danny Marino, who was Castellano's contact man with the Westies, the Irish gang of killers operating out of Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. De Chico did not know what the meeting was about. Frankie said it was set for around 5 o'clock, December 16th, at a steak joint down in the city called Sparks. Chapter 15 It was, like they say, elementary, my dear Watson. 
The more we thought about it, the better it looked, Sammy said. We concluded that nine days before Christmas, around five to six o'clock at night, in the middle of Manhattan, in the middle of the rush hour, in the middle of the crush of all them shoppers buying presents, there would be literally thousands of people on the street hurrying this way and that. The hit would only take a few seconds, and the confusion would be in our favor. Nobody would be expecting anything like this, least of all Paul. And being able to disappear afterwards in the crowds would be in our favor. So we decide this is when and where it's going to happen. The day before, we have a meeting in the basement of my office on Stillwell Avenue. John comes down with Angelo and the entire hit team. John is supplying them because it's basically his problem. If everything gets fucked up and the team is killed, whatever it may be, why should we take down our own guys, put them at risk? Frankie DeChico comes down with Joe Watts. Altogether, there are 11 of us. There are four shooters, all from John's crew. Only one of them, John Carneglia, is a made guy. They'll be waiting for Paul at the front door to Sparks. Another guy with John, Tony Roach Rampino, will be a backup right across the street from Sparks. Sparks is on East 46th Street between 3rd and 2nd Avenue, closer to 3rd. Up the street towards second as backups will be Angie, Joe Watts, and another associate with John, Iggy Alonia. John and me will be in a car on the other side of Third Avenue. If it comes down to it, I'll be the backup at that end. So we had Sparks Steakhouse sandwiched in. John, Angie, me, Frankie, and Joe Watts know who's going to be hit. John just says to everybody else that there's going to be two guys killed. He says he ain't saying who they are yet, but it's a huge hit. John tells them that no matter what, don't run even if there are cops around. These two guys have got to go. Don't worry about the cops, he says, because if you run and these guys ain't dead, we'll kill you. The following afternoon, everyone except DeChico gathered in a park on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Frankie will be inside Sparks, making sure that Jimmy Brown and Danny Marino, all the people there for the meeting with Paul, don't do anything. Joe Watts drove me to the park. The shooters were there. The four of them wore long white trench coats and black fur Russian hats. You couldn't tell one guy from the other. I don't know whose idea that was. I guess John's, but I thought it was brilliant. Nobody would pay any attention to them. I mean, in New York, you could practically walk down the street naked and nobody would notice. Besides, Sparks was only a couple of blocks from the United Nations. You saw all kinds of different clothes. But the big thing would be confusing the witnesses. Well, what was their weight, their height? I don't know. What did they look like? I don't know. They all looked alike. And these would be people who don't even know what was going on, who weren't prepared for it. All they would remember were the outfits. Walkie-talkies were handed out so we could communicate with one another. Then John told everybody that it was Paul and Tommy Bellotti who were going. We went over real quick what everybody's position would be. I left the park with John and a Lincoln. He owned a Lincoln, but I don't think this one was his personal car. Frankie had told us that after court, Paul was first going to go to the office of his lawyer, Jimmy La Rosa, so we figured he wouldn't get to Sparks before five o'clock. I don't think we said hardly anything on the way uptown. Our minds were on what was going to happen. John pulled the Lincoln in on the northwest corner of 3rd Avenue and 46th Street. People were swarming all around, just like we thought. I could see the canopy that said Sparks. The shooters in their white coats were already waiting by it. I could see Tony Roach across the street. The other guys up towards second I couldn't see. The problem was our parking spot on the corner wasn't too good. We were sticking out into the crosswalk. So John said he was driving around the block again. There was the chance that Paul would arrive while we were doing this, but a cop might come over to ticket us the way we were parked and might recognize John. Besides, if it went the way we wanted, we were just observers. 
John circled the block. When we came back, the spot was a little better, and we pulled in again. A couple of minutes later, another Lincoln came up next to us and stopped for a light. The dome light was on in the Lincoln, and when I looked into it, I saw Tommy Bellotti and Paul. They were talking to each other. Tommy wasn't three feet away from me. I turned and told John. I got on the walkie-talkie and warned the guys outside Sparks that Paul would be there any second. I reached for my gun. I said to John, if Tommy turns towards me, I would start shooting. No, no, he said. We got our people in place. Yeah, I said. But if Tommy sees us, maybe they won't go there. Just then the light changed, and Tommy pulled up in front of Sparks. I didn't see Paul getting out, only the white coats moving towards the Lincoln. But I saw Tommy get out from the driver's side. All of a sudden, he was squatting down like he was seeing something, which was Paul getting shot. And then I saw a white coat come up behind Tommy, and Tommy went down. The white coat was bending over him. I looked to see if any of the people on the street was doing anything. They weren't. John slowly drove across 3rd Avenue into the block where Sparks was. I looked down at Tommy Bellotti laying in a huge puddle of blood in the street, and I said to John, He's gone. I couldn't see Paul. John picked up speed, and we took a right down 2nd Avenue and headed back to Brooklyn, to Stillwell Avenue. I didn't see any of the shooters or the backup guys. We had the radio on, 1010 News, I think. On the way, we heard the report that there was a shooting in Midtown Manhattan, and next that one of the victims was the reputed mob boss, Paul Castellano. But I was in such a haze that I don't remember anything else about that ride. If you offered me two million dollars, I couldn't tell you. Frankie DeChico came to my office to meet me and John. He said one of the waiters at Sparks came over to him and Jimmy Brown, Jimmy Fila, and said Paul had been shot. He said Jimmy turned white and told him he could have been in the car with Paul, and Frankie said, don't worry, you wouldn't have been hurt. And Frankie said when they left the restaurant, they ran into Tommy Gambino. Frankie told him that his uncle just got shot and to go back to his car and get the fuck out of there. I don't know who shot who. You don't ask. I only heard later from John that one of the shooters, Vinny Artuso, didn't get a shot off. His gun jammed. Everything else went according to plan. It was like they say, elementary, my dear Watson. We made an agreement that nobody involved in this from here on out would ever speak to each other about it at any time, under any circumstances, and wouldn't admit anything to anybody else in our family or in any of the other families. The manner and place of Castellano's death catapulted him from relatively minor media interest to the sort of coverage reserved for the assassination of a head of state. Not only did the tabloids go all out, Big Paul, chauffeur, take their last ride, but the New York Times featured it on the front page, above the fold, two days running. Castellano and Bellotti were each reported to have been shot six times, each also the recipient of a coup de grace to the head. The city's police commissioner said that, according to witnesses, it was uncertain whether two or three men had carried out the gangland executions. No one remembered seeing four. What eyewitnesses most recalled was that the assassins were wearing identical Russian fur caps and long coats, variously described as either dark or light-colored. They were then seen fleeing on foot towards Second Avenue. A witness said that one of the gunmen had been holding a walkie-talkie immediately prior to the shootings. The head of the state's organized crime task force declared that Castellano's violent death would have required the formal approval of the bosses of the other four families in the city. Bruce Mao knew better, but he wasn't available for interviews. Sammy owned a quarter interest in Caesars East, a restaurant on 58th Street off 3rd Avenue, 12 blocks due north of Sparks. We had to have a meeting of the captains and the family, Sammy said. Frankie DeChico spoke to me about doing it in Caesars East. We rushed the meeting. 
It was a couple of days after Paul went down. After the regular customers cleared out, all the captains met downstairs at a long table, except Tommy Gambino, who I don't believe we called. The drivers and anybody else that was brought stayed upstairs. The only ones down there who wasn't a captain was Angelo and me. We stayed behind everybody at each side of the table. We had guns. You could say we were there for intimidating purposes. Joe Gallo was at the head of the table. Frankie and John were on each side of him. He was our consigliere. With Paul gone and Neil being dead, he was now in official control of the family. He was an old-timer, and he's playing this game with the captains. He knew what to say. He knew the ins and outs of Cosa Nostra. He told them that we had no idea who killed Paul. He said he was going to use Frankie and John to help him run the family and to investigate what happened. He told them not to discuss anything with anybody outside our family about the hit and not have any members carry guns or overreact to anything. Anything they heard or found out, they were to report it back through John Gotti or Frankie DeChico. I think they were all shook up. They knew we probably did it, but they didn't know for sure and they could see Joe Gallo was not saying, arm yourselves and get ready for war. He was communicating that they would be all right. Nobody was in trouble. Nobody was going to get hurt. We're going to have an investigation. Officially, this is how we went to the other families. We told them we didn't know what happened with Paul, but our family was intact. We weren't in a position that a war would break out. We had no internal trouble and we didn't want anybody to get involved in our problems. A couple of weeks later, all the captains were called in again. The meeting was held in the recreation room of some big housing project in downtown Manhattan. Somebody knew somebody who gave us access to that room. Joe Gallo reiterates that we still don't know what was going on, we're still investigating. But the time had come to put our family together and vote for a new boss. Everybody's got the drift by now. It's all over the newspapers that John Gotti did the hit. And they can see the closeness of Frankie DeChico, Sammy the Bull, Joe Piney, Joe Gallo. Between themselves, before Paul was hit, Frankie and John have agreed that John will be the boss and Frankie the underboss. At the meeting, Frankie gets up and votes for John Gotti. It zips right around the room. Nobody opposes. It's unanimous. At that point, John announces that Frankie will be his underboss and that Joe Gallo will stay on as consigliere of the family. He says he's making Angie Ruggiero the captain of his old crew. Frankie's uncle, Georgie, will replace Frankie. Now I'm going to be made an official captain too, but I don't want it announced there and then. Toto Aurello was at the meeting and he knew I was part of this whole move. I want to give respect to Toto and not have anything like that done while he's sitting there. I went to him afterwards and I told him that if he wanted to stay on as captain of the crew, I would start up a new crew. I said, it's completely up to you, whatever you want. And he said, Sammy, I'm tired. I've been using you as acting captain. I'd like to step down. I said, okay. You've been like a father to me. I'll take the crew and you'll be directly with the administration of the family. That'll be great, he said. He shakes my hand and gives me a kiss and says, be careful. I set up an appointment with John, Frankie, and Toto, where Toto asks official permission to step down. They give it, and that same night they make me a capo. John makes some other moves. He appoints his brother Jeannie a captain, and he breaks Tony Scotto down from being a captain to a soldier. Scotto had been away for payoffs and tax evasion. I happened to be at Paul's when Tony had recommended Sonny Ciccone to be acting captain to run the dock workers in his absence. Tony had mixed in with a lot of celebrities, politicians, like that guy running for president, Eugene McCarthy, entertainers, whatever, and John wasn't too fond of him. So he replaced him officially with Sonny. Now was the point to see if we were going to get retaliation from any of the other families. If there would be a war, 
so we sent out committees to notify them that we had elected a new boss, who our new boss and underboss was, who our new captains were. We said, this is our new administration. We're still investigating the Paul situation. There are no problems in our family. We don't want no sanctions against us, and we want our commission's seat. We got recognition from every family, including the Genovese family, except the Genovese people said there was a rule broken, that this situation with Paul had to be put to rest, and someday somebody would have to answer for that if and when the commission ever got together again. We said, don't worry, as soon as we find out, we will retaliate. Until then, we're just going to run our family. We had our commission seat, and from what we thought, it didn't seem like there was going to be any war. There wasn't going to be anything. It had gone up as high as the commission level, and there wasn't any opposition in any way, shape, or form. Frankie and me had still been hiding out with guns in a safe house set up by Joe Watts. We were still tight, but after about a month, we started to loosen up somewhat. And then about three months after this, it happened. On Sunday, April the 13th, 1986, like politicians rallying loyal supporters, Gotti and DeChico planned to visit the Veterans and Friends Club in Bensonhurst, the headquarters of the family's private trash-collecting capo, Jimmy Brown Phila. Sammy would also be on hand. We're doing our little stops, Sammy said, gathering power and strength, building momentum. Me and Frankie get there. We have coffee, see the boys, do a little, hey, how you doing, good to see you. And then John gives us a call. He can't make it. He'll meet us in the city. Frankie tells me this. So we plan to go to the city in Frankie's Buick Electra, but we stay for a while doing our thing, talking to the boys. Then this maid guy in the Lucchese family, Frankie Hartz, Frank Bolino, comes over and asks Frankie to Chico, hey, do you have a card for that lawyer, Al Arone? And Frankie says, yeah, I think I got it. He looks through his wallet, all the other cards he's got in his pocket, but he doesn't have it. He says, you know what? It's probably in the fucking car, in the glove compartment. I said, Frank, you want me to get it? And he says, no, you'll never find it. There's a lot of shit in there. Come on, he says to Frankie Hartz. I'm sure it's there. And they both walk out of the club. I'm still inside the club. From what I heard later, as they walk across the street, they could see a bag under the car, a paper bag. Frankie DeChico joked with Frankie Hartz, look at that bag, there's probably a bomb under my car. He don't think any more about it. It's an absolute rule in Cosa Nostra that you don't use bombs. Frankie DeChico opens up the door and slides in on the passenger side, and he's looking through the glove compartment while Frankie Hartz is standing there. That's when the bomb went off. Frankie Hartz goes flying backwards. The blast blew his shoes off and his toes. When I heard the explosion, I didn't think of a car. It was so fucking powerful, it sounded like a whole building blew up, a boiler or something. I came out of the club, and Frankie's car is in fucking flames. And there's Frankie Hartz with the blood shooting out of his feet. I go flying across the street. I saw Frankie DeChico laying on the ground beside the car. With the fire, it could blow again. I tried to pull him away. I grabbed a leg, but he ain't coming with it. The leg is off. One of his arms is off. His Uncle Georgie came running over with another guy, Butterass, and a guy named Oscar. They're trying to help me. I got my hand under him, and my hand went right through his body to his stomach. There's no ass. His ass, his balls, everything is completely blown off. Just then, a police van comes by on patrol. It backs in, and they lower the tailgate, and we pick Frankie up, holding whatever we can of him together, and put him in the van. Then they got Frankie Hartz and put him in the van, and they shoot off for Victory Memorial Hospital. I was wearing a white shirt. I looked at my shirt, amazed. There wasn't a drop of blood on it. The force of the blast, the concussion, blew most of the fluids right out of Frankie's body. He had no blood left in him, 
Nothing, not an ounce. I told my brother-in-law, Eddie Garofalo, who'd tried to help me with Frankie, to get going right away and go to John's club. I said, he's supposed to meet us in the city, but he's in Queens still. Tell him what happened. Then I told him to get all my guys to meet at my place, Tolly's, and to come heavy. Everybody who was in the club is out on the street. I looked over and I thought Danny Marino had the strangest expression on his face. He's with Jimmy Brown's crew and him and Jimmy were waiting at Sparks for Paul. But I thought then that he was just scared. I'm telling them all to go to Tolly's. Jimmy Brown said he'd be at home if I needed him. Danny Marino said the same thing. A guy named Paulie, a maid guy in the family, comes near me and says, what the fuck good are they at home? That remark never left me. In my head, I was thinking it was true. Who needed them at home? But I didn't even answer. I was too busy. My brother-in-law had come back and said, John wants to see you right now, immediately. I got in the car and go to this restaurant in Queens where John is. He says, well, we got problems. I know, I said. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but we definitely have problems. For four months since Sparks, we figured it was over. No problems. And here's Frankie all at once blown to bits. I'm still at the restaurant when one of John's people walked in and said, John, Frankie's dead. They said he died on the way to the hospital. He was already dead on the street, I thought. He had nothing left in him. John said the only thing was to stay on full alert and see what comes next, what we could find out. It looked like there could be a war after all. Our first thought was the Genovese family, but the Chin was a real stickler for the rules of our life, and one of the rules was you don't use bombs. Nobody had pulled off a bombing in New York since the beginning of Cosa Nostra. Would Chin break this kind of rule? Was Frankie fucking some guy's wife that we didn't know about? Maybe Greaseballs from Sicily did it. Paul had a lot of connections over there, and in Sicily, they bomb all the time. When I went back to Tolly's, I told everybody to keep their eyes and ears open, report anything they picked up, but there wasn't anything, not a peep. Everything stayed quiet. It seemed like whoever was behind this was willing to settle for the satisfaction of taking down Frankie. It was only a long, long time afterwards that I found out what happened, and that it was Frankie and John they were really after, the they being Gas Pipe Castle from the Lucchese family and Chin Giganti. I was shocked. It goes to show how Cosa Nostra was just one double cross after another. We had reached out and got Gas Pipe's tacit approval about Paul. Maybe Chin don't know this. But after Paul goes down, Chin grabs gas pipe. They had a relationship and says, well, Paul's out of the picture. Let's take out John Gotti and Frankie DeChico. It'll be a real hit parade. They tell Jimmy Brown and Danny Marino what they're going to do and that Jimmy and Danny will be appointed by the commission as a committee to run the Gambino family for Chin. Let me tell you what a stand-up guy Jimmy Brown is. If some black guy walked in and said he just killed Paul Castellano and was the new boss, Jimmy would say, gee, great. What do you want me to do, boss? So basically, the Genovese and Lucchese families would control our family. Gas pipe was a couple of blocks away when the bomb went off. The mistake was using a couple of West Side guys, meaning they were associated with the Genovese people. I still don't know who they were or even if they're alive. One of them put the bomb under Frankie's car. The other one was on the remote control. When he sees Frankie come out of the club with Frankie Hartz, he thinks Frankie Hartz was John. Frankie Hartz has the same kind of build as John and the same grayish hair. And he presses the button. Boom! I got along good with Gas Pipe. I still like him. For him, it was business. A master Cosa Nostra double-cross scheme, nothing personal. The only thing I didn't like was the bomb. I would have more respect for him if he used a gun, according to the rules. I think the bomb was probably a devious chin idea to make us think the Sicilians done it. I heard when my name came up, Gaspipe said, 
Forget it. We're not going to kill Sammy. That would have been another mistake. If John had been in the car and they put in Jimmy Brown and Marino, I would have killed them both. They were the true betrayers. They knew what was going to happen, and then I would have gone after Gaspipe and Chin. I don't think I could have won, but I would have fought until my death. Besides his toes, Frankie Hart's got mangled up a little, but he survived. That was how I found out what was going on just before the blast. I decided one thing. I used to drive myself. I was getting a driver. Not to say that joke line like in the movies where the old boss tells his wife, go start the car, but to never leave my car alone anymore so nobody can fuck with it. Chapter 16 In the cabinet, there was a 380 with a silencer. The day after Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti were shot, Bruce Mao dispatched agents on the Gambino squad to check on high-profile family members. Two agents, Frank Spiro and Matty Tricarico, were assigned to Frank DeChico. Spiro and Tricarico, who were born, grew up, and lived in Staten Island, had been on the squad since its inception. Their responsibility was to keep tabs on Staten Island residents in the family, which included DeChico. They headed for DeChico Social Club on Bath Avenue in Bensonhurst. On a street corner near the club, they spotted DeChico and weren't surprised to observe him in animated conversation with Jimmy Brown, Robert DeBee, Di De Bernardo, and Angelo Ruggiero. What did surprise them was the presence of Sammy Gravano. And clearly, Sammy was not merely an acolyte. From his body language, it was almost as if he were chairing the conference. While they knew Sammy by sight, he'd attracted no particular investigative interest. Now, suddenly, he appeared to be a major player. For the first time, Sammy made Mao's A-list. But for the public at large, he was as anonymous as ever. Not so. John Gotti. As recently as 1984, Gotti, the would-be mob boss, retained many of the characteristics of a street thug. That year, near a bar in Queens, Romuel Pisick, a refrigerator repairman, returned from cashing his weekly paycheck and found his car blocked by Gotti's double-parked Lincoln. Furious, Pisick started blowing his horn. A man later identified as Frank Coletta, came out of the bar, punched him, and seized the $325 sticking out of his shirt pocket. In the altercation that followed, Coletta was joined by Gotti himself, who also emerged from the bar and slapped Pisick so hard in the face that his nose bled profusely. Gotti told him to get lost. Pisick found two cops and said that he'd just been beaten and robbed. He led them back to the bar and pointed out Gotti and Coletta as his assailants. As Gotti was being handcuffed by one of the cops, he demanded, Don't you know who I am? To his evident displeasure, the cop replied, No, and I don't care. After being booked, Gotti and Coletta were released on bail and subsequently indicted for felony assault and theft. After the Castellano hit, Gotti dramatically refined his act. Hollywood churns out our myths, and for a decade, the Godfather epics and the Mafia had eclipsed Westerns in popular culture to fulfill America's mythic needs. Life wasn't so simple anymore. A shootout at the O.K. Corral didn't seem so relevant. At the first sign of sagebrush, audiences began nodding off. Enter the Mafia to embody and reflect our deepest anxieties, yearnings, wonderment, our imagination. What better mirrored fierce free enterprise with everyone's shiver, life on the line, the resourcefulness of a nation ever on the move, constantly plunging into innovative and profitable technologies, say casino gambling? 
What was the difference between someone out to control private garbage collection, with the judicious use of baseball bats on kneecaps, and a cabal of ostensibly upright church-going savings and loan officials bilking taxpayers out of billions of dollars? Who among us, having been wronged, hadn't fantasized about calling upon brothers in blood to wreak suitable vengeance? A nice picked body, perhaps, trussed like a turkey, bobbing up somewhere? The fictional Godfather was myth-making at its most compelling. It took an intricately structured other world that was in fact without the slightest hint of social redemption and reinvented it, populated not with good guys and bad guys, but with people you could root for and against. Its protagonists were flawed, not superhuman projections of good and evil, caught in destinies not of their own making. Never mind that loyalty and honor played no part in the actual Cosa Nostra. Perceived reality was what mattered. The Godfather saga contained everything that concerned and excited us. Family, romance, betrayal, power, lust, greed, legitimacy, even salvation. And all played out on a grand stage, with death inevitable and often violent, waiting in the wings. The problem was that there were no non-fiction equivalents. All the media had left to contend with was the gray corporate executive image of a Paul Castellano, the visage of a doer Tony Ducks Corallo, or a cigar-chomping fat Tony Salerno, the nutty chin gigante, the unappetizing carmine snake Persico. John Gotti fixed all that. Because of the sensational nature of Castellano's execution, he became the immediate object of intense press attention when federal, state, and local law enforcement let it be known that he was the prime suspect behind the murder, the new, real-life godfather. He rose to the occasion and dressed for it. He looked the way Americans wanted a gangster to look. It was as if he'd studied every gangster movie ever made and absorbed the lessons learned in his own persona. With his diamond pinky ring, meticulously styled silvery hair, a healthy tan from regular sunlamp treatments, his wardrobe of $2,000 custom-made Brioni double-breasted suits and $200 hand-painted ties, the tabloids were soon labeling him the Dapper Don. Instead of skulking in the shadows, he reveled in his new celebrity. Always flashing a smile, he embraced TV cameras. He was ready with quotable quips. Sure, I'm the boss of the family, my wife and kids. He projected a courtly manner. Making way for a female reporter, he told her, I was brought up to hold doors open for ladies. There were breathless reports of how mobsters had lined up at a Christmas party at the Ravenite Club to kiss him and pay homage. He appeared at every opportunity to be saying, Yeah, I'm a gangster, but can you prove it? All but unknown prior to Castellano's demise, his past was dredged up. He'd been the avenger in the kidnapping death of an innocent youngster, albeit Carlo Gambino's nephew and had taken the rap for it in manly fashion. The mysterious disappearance of the neighbor who had run over Gotti's own son evoked delicious chills. His regular, solitary vigils at the boy's crypt were somberly described. Who couldn't sympathize with a father's pain and anguish? There were more awed shivers when the Romuald Pysik assault case finally went to trial on March 24, 1986, some three months after Castellano was gunned down. Pysik read the papers and by now was well aware of whom he was dealing with. On the stand, he declared in a shaken voice that he was unable to recognize anyone in the courtroom who had punched and smacked him. To be perfectly honest, he insisted, it was so long ago, I don't remember. The judge had no choice but to dismiss the charges. Afterward, Pysik offered reporters a more reasonable explanation for his memory loss. 
He had an extreme interest in living the rest of his life without fear. Before the year was out, Time magazine had featured Gotti on its cover, accompanied by the stark line, Crime Boss, in a painting by the pop artist Andy Warhol. Till then, the only other gangster to have graced a Time cover a half-century before was Al Capone. The Pisic case, however, would have some unpleasant repercussions for Gotti. Lost in the avalanche of big league federal attacks against Cosa Nostra the year before, among them the commission case, the Bonanno family's pizza connection heroin trial, the Colombo family's criminal enterprise case, Gotti himself had been indicted on RICO charges. The case had been developed by a young assistant U.S. attorney in Brooklyn named Diane Giacalone, who'd grown up in Ozone Park and often walked by the Bergen Hunt and Fish Social Club, observing the unsavory characters hanging out there on her way to and from Our Lady of Wisdom parochial school. She'd won a conviction against a gang of local armored car hijackers, who she learned had tried to curry favor with the Bergen crew by passing on part of the proceeds. When she believed she'd gathered enough evidence to substantiate these tributes, she proceeded against Gotti and others. This ends Side 1 of Cassette 7. Please turn the cassette over and start Side 2 at the same point. The Gambino squad was not happy. The case was too tenuous. Confident that Gotti's high-wire celebrity turn would do him in, it was looking forward to nailing him in a major and foolproof case. Then Mao learned that Giacalone was threatening to reveal that one of Gotti's co-defendants, Willie Boy Johnson, was a prized Gambino squad informant. She intended to use this as a club to force him to testify for her prosecution. She'd learned about Willie Boy from the New York Police Department. When narcotics detectives had nabbed Willie Boy in a drug deal in an effort to extricate himself, he said he'd been an FBI source and offered to perform the same services for the cops. The FBI attempted to dissuade Giacalone, but she remained obstinate. Finally, the Bureau stepped out of the case completely, citing administrative and procedural differences. Johnson pleaded with Giacalone to reconsider. I will be killed, he said. My family will be slaughtered. At a pretrial court hearing, despite vehemently denying he'd been an informer, he was held without bail and against his will placed in protective custody in a federal detention facility in New York, the Metropolitan Correctional Center. Giacalone then made a second move that garnered big headlines, citing clear intimidation on Gotti's part in the dismissal of the Pisic assault case, she requested that he be denied bail and jailed so that he couldn't tamper with her witnesses. The judge agreed, and on May 19th, Gotti wound up in the Metropolitan Correctional Center with Johnson. It was up on the ninth floor, Sammy said. John told Willie Boy, you did a bad thing for all them years, but I'll forgive you. It's not the first time it happened. You can never be with us after this case, but nothing will happen to you. Willie Boy asked John to swear on his dead son's head, and John did. And Willie Boy never did testify. John totally conned Willie Boy. I don't know how he fell for this, but he did. Lock, stock, and barrel. About two weeks after Gotti was taken into custody, Sammy received his first order from him to execute a hit. Since Frankie DeChico's gone, John had appointed myself, Angelo the Blabbermouth Ruggiero, and Joe Piney Armon to run the family. We're captains, and we were all in the move against Paul. Basically, Joe Piney is half out of it. He's basically there to placate the old-timers. I go over to his house in the morning, and he's got all kinds of racetrack forms and stuff. The old man is a good man. He loves the horses. He completely adores his wife and children. 
but he really isn't equipped to run the family. One time he told me, I got a plan to get the press off John's back, a diversion to get the heat off. I said, yeah, what? He says, we can kill Oliver North. Who the fuck is Oliver North? You know, that soldier that caused all the trouble down in Washington. Oh, right. If we kill him, Joe Piney says, there will be so much attention over that, the public, the news media, won't pay no attention to John anymore. I want to pay him respect. I don't want to embarrass the old guy. I bob and weave a little and say, let me think about it for a while and we'll see. That gives you an example of the thinking power he had at that time. Thank God he never brought this up again. Anyway, John has limited visitation. Only his lawyers, his immediate family, and his closest friend, Angie, can see him. So Angie is the messenger to communicate what John wants done. In early June, Angie came to me and said John has sent out an order to kill DeBee, Robert DiBernardo. He said DeBee was talking behind his back, and there were other reasons which Angie didn't say. Now, I have been seeing to be a couple of times a week. We share responsibility for dealing with Bobby Sasso, who's running the Teamsters. To a brilliant, wealthy guy. Paul used him directly with the unions and other business, and he's in with these Jewish guys as the largest distributor of X-rated films and stuff in the country. He was one of the owners of Great Bear Auto Repair and Tire Service. But to is no threat. He's got no crew no strength. I already have a sense of what this is about. Angelo wants to be underboss. Joe Piney had told me to be said to Angie he had the balls to be underboss, but not the brains. If anyone should be underboss, to be said, it should be Sammy. That didn't mean anything to me. I don't even want to discuss it with Joe Piney. I loved Frankie like a brother, and I'm sick that he's dead. I had lost the one guy whose advice I could trust. Right then, I'm not interested in the position or even talking about it. I said to Angie that if DeBee was saying anything, it didn't mean nothing. Just talk. DeBee wasn't dangerous. I asked Angie to reach John and see if we couldn't hold up on this. And when John came out, we would discuss it. It was something we could hold up on. But Angie immediately responded that it had to be done. John was steaming. John's brother Jeannie and Jeannie's crew would do the hit at this house of the mother of one of the soldiers. I was to get to be there for a meeting, and whoever was sitting behind to be would shoot him. But the house wasn't available. Angie came back to me. He said John was really hot. He wanted it done right now. He wanted it done right, and he wanted me to do it. I didn't know what Angie was telling John about my reservations. I knew Angie was into to be for 250000 I would imagine that this could have played a part in everything. But I don't know if John knew that. Maybe John had some other motives, some hidden resentment from the past. Frankie and me had a tough time even getting John to elevate to be to captain after Paul got hit. But I never questioned that he gave the order. Obviously, sooner or later, I'm going to be talking to John myself, and Angie can't get caught in fucking lies. What was I going to do? What can I do? It's an order from the boss. This was the life I chose, and the boss was the boss. I told Angie that DeBee would be coming by my office for a construction meeting at 5.30. He said he would be at the Burger King in Coney Island from 6 on. If I succeeded, I should meet him there. I sent the girl in my office home at five. Me, my brother-in-law Eddie, and old man Peruta were there. DeB came in and said hello. I told Peruta to get him a cup of coffee. In the cabinet, there was a 380 with a silencer. Peruta took it out, walked over to DeB, and shot him twice in the back of the head. We picked up DeB and put him in a body bag we got from the Scarpacci funeral parlor. We locked it in the back room. We cleaned up the office, and Eddie drove me to meet Angie at the Burger King. I told Angie it was done. I told him I had the keys to DeBee's Mercedes. 
He said he would meet me later at Tolly's around nine and would arrange to get rid of the body and the car. Angie was at Tolly's with Jeannie Gotti and John Carneglia, who were tight with him in junk. Frank Locascio, a captain from the Bronx, was there too. We went back to my office. DeBe was put in the trunk of Locascio's Cadillac. Some kids with Carneglia took DeBe's Mercedes. I don't know what they did with the Mercedes, but Carneglia owned a car salvage yard. I have no idea what was done with DeBe. Now Angie is also a defendant with John in the case this Jackaloni is bringing. And sometime after this, Angie is in court for a hearing, and his son says something to him from where the spectators sit. The judge tells the kid to be quiet, and Angie turns around to the judge and says, What the fuck is this, Russia? Who the fuck are you to tell me I can't talk to my son? The judge is in a frenzy. They go at it, and the judge remands Angie. His bail is revoked, and he's in jail with John. John is steaming. Blabbermouth Angie can forget being the underboss, if he ever had a chance. Through Jeannie Gotti, who has visitation rights, we get the word that John has settled on Joe Piney as underboss. But Jeannie said he told John that while Joe was a beautiful guy, a good choice to smooth things over, he can't really run the family. So John said to tell me that it's in my hands to do it, but to include Joe in everything and treat him with respect. And I do follow the proper protocol. That was when Joe Piney came up with that Oliver North thing. But basically, I'm running the family for John. After jury selection, Diane Giacalone's prosecution began in the middle of September 1986. Because of Gotti, a trial that normally would have been ignored by the media until a verdict had come in, and even then been worth no more than two or three paragraphs, took on a carnival atmosphere. Spectators packed the courtroom every day. So did reporters. Television crews were a constant presence. Gotti's sartorial splendor received daily press attention. He was said to have instructed his co-defendants to appear in jackets and ties. He was heard to chastise one of them for unacceptable color coordination. His apparent coolness under fire, his brash confidence in being acquitted, was most commented on. I'm not worried, he was quoted as jauntily saying. They got no case. It's a frame. You'll see. I'll be walking out of here. Bruce Cutler, a hitherto minor figure in the criminal defense community, basked in Gotti's glory. He'd represented Gotti in the Pisic case, and Gotti had elected to keep him on. He appeared to fawn over his client, aping his dress. If he had a son, he told reporters, he could think of no finer role model for him than John Gotti. Bellicose, a former college wrestler, he attacked from the beginning. Brandishing the indictment in front of the jury, he bellowed that it was rancid and rotten. It makes you want to retch and vomit, he cried. He carried the sheaf of papers to a trash can and hurled it in. This is where it belongs. Partway through the trial, all the bosses in the Cosa Nostra commission case being tried in federal court in Manhattan were convicted. Paul Castellano would have been one of them. They would receive sentences of a hundred years each. Asked by a reporter if this wasn't disheartening, Gotti continued to display a remarkable sang-froid. Waving a dismissive hand, he said, That's got nothing to do with me. I'll be home soon. The trial dragged on for nearly seven months. The verdict, not guilty, was rendered after a week's deliberation on March 13, 1987. Gotti's supporters and hangers-on cheered. Cutler hugged Gotti and kissed him. Cutler was hailed as a defense genius. And in the headlines the next morning, Gotti had a new trademark super K, the Teflon Don. Gotti had every reason to be nonchalant throughout the trial, and Bruce Cutler wasn't quite the genius he was cracked up to be. Sammy had fixed a juror, and not just any juror, but one who turned out to be the jury foreman. 
The head of the Westies had come to Sammy and told him that he knew someone on the jury who was available for a price. How much of a price? Sammy asked. The answer was $120,000. Ever the negotiator, Sammy whittled it down to $60,000, payable in installments. You never knew, he figured. The guy could get sick or something. Certain that there would be at least a hung jury with little likelihood of a retrial, Sammy's mind was elsewhere. The news was traumatic. He was about to lose his second and last, Luca Brasi. Chapter 17 Kill me, Sammy. Don't let me die like a dog. I love the old man, Joe Peruta, Sammy said. My feeling for him went beyond any blood oath of Cosa Nostra. He was the only one during all the plotting for the Castellano hit. All the what if this, what if that, that I confided in, was able to walk with, talk with, relax with. In one second, he agreed to take down Paul and Tommy Bellotti in that diner like I asked him to before we changed the plan. He never asked me any questions if I wanted him to do something. He would take any risk. After Stymie got shot, he practically never left my side. I think about him a lot, and I never know whether to laugh or cry. I remember once when he brought his wife and kids to Tolly's for dinner. She'd been complaining that he was always with me and never had any time for her and the children. So this was a night he was going to make up for it. We had a pretty decent kitchen at Tolly's, and one of the chef's specialties was an ice cream tart that was really delicious. So the night Joe was having his Peruta family dinner, he left word with the chef to be sure to have plenty of them tarts available. Everything was going good until it came time for dessert and Joe asked for the tarts he'd been touting. He was told that there wasn't no tarts left. He couldn't believe it. He knew the chef was told about this dinner and the tarts he wanted. Where were the fucking tarts? The chef said he was sorry, but another guy with me, Huck Tommy Carbonaro, a mountain of a man, had eaten all of Joe's tarts. Peruta was fuming, steaming, he waited till his family left Tolly's, and he approached me and asked my permission to clip Huck. I could see he wasn't fooling. Why would you want to hit Huck? I said, what's going on? And he told me the story. He said, that fat fuck eats everything in sight. He ate all my tarts. I said, you want to kill Huck because of some ice cream tarts? Yeah. I couldn't help myself. I started laughing. Well, I said... I ain't giving you permission. I said, come on, ice cream tarts. Finally, even Joe had to start smiling. I called Huck over and told him he owed me his life, and we all had a drink together. To me, Joe never seemed to change. He always looked the same, old and decrepit, always chain-smoking. But then, after the Debbie hit, his smoker's cough got worse and worse. Whatever doctor he was going to told him he should see a specialist. It could be serious. I made arrangements through doctors I knew and took him to Sloan Kettering, the big cancer hospital in Manhattan, for tests. The prognosis was bad. We were all stunned. He had lung cancer, and the cancer had spread in his body. He had only a year left. The chief attending doctor pulled me aside. After acknowledging his awareness of my reputation, he admitted that he had told a lie to Peruta and his family. The old man didn't have a year to live. It was more like three months. The old man had his little gambling and Shylock operations, and he had a piece of tallies. He was satisfied. He never asked for anything more. But I felt I had to honor him. John Gotti was still incarcerated. I sent word to him through Jeannie Gotti for permission to make Peruta a made guy in the family, and John approved it right away. I personally carried his name to the other families, so there was no question who was sponsoring him. We arranged for Joe's wife and everybody to be out of his house one afternoon. I got a bunch of captains together. We assembled around Joe's bed in the smoke-filled room. 
He wasn't going to stop smoking now. From what the doctor said, there was now only a month or two left for him. I closed the bedroom door, and the ceremony started. I was giving the oath. When it came time to ask the question that was the test of the candidate's loyalty, would you kill for this family? I almost said, I know you did kill for this family. And when it came time for me to prick Joe's finger for blood to mingle with burning the holy card, I realized how bad off he was. I could barely get a drop. It was a solemn ceremony. Maybe it wasn't as lavish as others I was at, but I can't remember one with more meaning of what Cosa Nostra was supposed to be. Now, Joe was not only a friend of mine, but a friend of ours. I felt real good the next day when his wife, who was more of a sister to me than my own sisters, called and said that all of a sudden Joe was full of new life. But who was kidding who? No fucking oath was stopping them cancer cells. Every time I went to visit him, I could see him getting weaker. He was like a living skeleton. He called me to his bedside. Tears were streaming down his face. He asked me to give him the dignity he was losing. He wanted to die like a man, not like this. He asked me to kill him. I stood there, my mouth open. How could he ask me such a thing? I couldn't even answer. Kill me, Sammy, he said. Don't let me die like a dog. Every visitor was the same. He wouldn't let it go. Kill me, Sammy, kill me, please. He tried to get me to understand that a swift bullet was the best gift a true friend could give him. He couldn't stand the pain no more. Like every hit, even a mercy killing of a made member, which this probably was the first, you got to get permission. I sent a message with Gene Gotti to John. I prepped Jeannie. I tried to explain the situation the best I could. I don't know for sure what Jeannie told John when they discussed Joe Peruda, but John's reply was no. There was no way he would authorize a hit on a made guy under these circumstances. It was like if Peruda wasn't made, it would be all right. Wasn't that ironic? I brought John's decision to Joe. He did not accept it. He said, fuck John, Sammy, I'm asking you. He prevailed on me that our friendship was above everything. The only way I could prove I was his friend was to kill him. So I went against John Gotti's wishes, and it wouldn't be the last time as to what was right. I ordered my brother-in-law, Eddie, to get a gun with a silencer. I was going to give Joe one day's notice to have his family away from the house when our friendship would be tested. Huck would be outside the house in a car. Eddie and myself would go through a back door that would be left open. We would go up to the bedroom. Eddie would help me sit the old man in a comfortable position and then join Huck in the car. I would kill my friend and stop his terrible pain and allow him dignity in death. It was all set. I was home waiting to be picked up by Huck and Eddie. My wife was there. The night before, I'd been real irritable. When Debbie mentioned this, I put her off. I said I had things on my mind. Now I stepped outside for a second, and when I came back, she said she had sad news. Eddie had just called. He said that old man Peruta suddenly took a turn for the worst. He was rushed to the hospital by ambulance, but died on the way. He was only 59. My man of loyalty, of heart and soul, a man of honor, was gone. Debbie looked at me kind of funny. She couldn't understand the smile on my face. She didn't know that the happiness I felt came from a piece of work I didn't have to do. I took care of his wife, Dottie, financially, like I'd done with Stymie's wife. A couple of days after the funeral, I was in my office. I was devastated, completely destroyed. In the space of a year and a half, I lost Stymie, then Frankie DeChico, and now Peruta. Big Lou Valerio came in. 
He had five, six years on me. He was a big guy, about six foot two, two thirty. He was already with Toto Orello when I went with Toto. So there was a long-term relationship here. After I was a captain, I got him made in the crew. He was super loyal and solid. He handled my appointments and kept me straight about what had to be done. He said, I know what you're feeling. I can't fill stymie shoes or perutas. I wouldn't even try, but I promise I'll be there for you. I said, I appreciate that very much. Well, I thought to myself, you can't put back what happened. You got to just keep going, no matter what. Chapter 18 I wanted my son to be legitimate, to have nothing to do with what I did. FBI agents Frank Spiro and Matty Tricorico quickly established that Sammy was not the usual wise guy. Members and associates of the various Gambino crews, 21 in all, would usually be found lounging around on the street outside their social clubs in apparently endless gab fests. But whenever Spiro and Tricorico stationed themselves in the afternoon near Sammy's office on Stillwell Avenue, they invariably saw him playing fast-paced handball for an hour or so in a nearby park with neighborhood teenagers, and more than holding his own with them. His handball partners tipped off Sammy that he was under observation. So did the teachers at an elementary school a couple of blocks down from his office. Sammy had set up his daughter, Karen, in a florist shop on Stillwell. There's some kind of a holiday coming up, Sammy said. Mother's Day or something. And this little kid came in and asked my daughter how much a rose was. When Karen told her, the kid started to cry and was walking out of the shop. Karen asked what was wrong, and the little girl said she didn't have that kind of money. So Karen, instead of giving her a rose, which was expensive, got a carnation and wrapped it in green tissue paper and put it in a small box with a card. For nothing. The kid, like kids are, told all the other kids at the school, and the next thing... Karen has grabbed me. Dad, there must be 50 or 100 kids coming into the shop for carnations. Then she told me the story. She can't give out that many. She's got a partner. I said, that was a nice thing you did. Tell you what, give every one of them kids a carnation and give me the bill. I'll pay for the kids. Of course, this got around at the school. I think one of the teachers went and thanked Karen and she said, no, it was my dad. Anyways, a couple of the teachers come to me and said, Mr. Gravano, can we talk to you? Sure, what can I do for you? And they said, nothing. We just want you to know there are people watching you with binoculars and cameras. Is everything all right? I smiled and said, don't worry. I must be getting a little on the famous side. You're not going to ask for my autograph. They laughed and said no and started to leave. I grabbed one of them and said, why are you telling me this? She said, you're good for the community. You were so good to the kids, we'll never forget it. I felt real good about that. After all those years, Bensonhurst was still a community. I didn't just like that. I loved it. Spiro and Tricorico immediately noticed something else about Sammy. Wise guys were not renowned early risers. But Sammy was out of his new walled-in home on Lampert's Lane on Staten Island at 6 a.m. His driver, Louis Sacchetti, would pick him up. He would usually breakfast about a mile away at a diner called Dakota. He would then cross over the Verrazano Bridge and work out at a gym off the Belt Parkway in Brooklyn before arriving at his Stillwell Avenue office around 10. To Spiro and Tricorico. The office seemed to double as a social club for Sammy's crew, which enabled them, through photographs and license plates, to put together a fairly accurate rundown of who was in the crew. It was also obvious how much respect he was being paid, just in the way he was accompanied at lunchtime to a small Italian deli down the avenue featuring hero sandwiches. A lot of the scores I made 
I cut up with my whole crew, Sammy said. No other guys like me did that. As a matter of fact, John Gotti called me in one time and he said, Sammy, what are you doing? All of your guys are making money, too much money. I said, hey, John, they've wrapped up their lives around me 24 hours a day. When I'm sleeping, they're making sure I get picked up, who's going to drop me off, where I'm supposed to be, what meetings I have to be at. They don't have a life of their own. They can't, really, a lot of them, go out and earn money. He said, no, no, Sammy, you got to keep them down. Bobby Borriello, who's his driver and bodyguard, I give him 600 a week. I looked at him and said, 600 a week? He picks up one tab. He's broke for the week. How can he support a family? How can he live? How can he do anything? Listen to me, he says. Keep them broke. Keep them hungry. Don't make them too fat. I can play Machiavellian like John. John was always quoting Machiavelli. I guess he did read him. So I just said, all right, yeah, that's good thinking. But I went to Tally's that night, and I think we cut up 50,000. I put it on the table out back. Big Louie, Huck, Eddie, this one, that one, everybody cut it up. I always took the bigger end because I'm the boss, and that was right. I'm their boss. But to leave them broke, that ain't right. I mean... John was caught on tape about Big Louis Valario, who opened a club called Illusions, where the Plaza Suite used to be. John dropped in with some of his guys to make a show, and he told Louis, Good luck. This is what we need. Places like this. Makes us look good. And then on the tape, John is saying, This fucking bum Louis was nothing more than a coffee boy. He didn't have two cents to rub together. And all of a sudden now, he's opened up a million-dollar disco. This Sammy's crazy. That's how John thought. Hold them down. Spiro and Tricarico saw more evidence of Sammy's stature in the Tuesday night gatherings at his bar and restaurant, Tolly's, on Bensonhurst's main thoroughfare, 18th Avenue and 62nd Street. During their surveillance on any given Tuesday, they would spot scores of men crowding in there, members of Sammy's crew and others in the Gambino family, some of them captains, as well as captains and soldiers from the Colombo and Lucchese families. By then, Sammy had become, as they say in the mob, a Shylock's Shylock, and Tuesday was settle-up night on either the weekly interest or the principal due from such customers as other loan sharks or bookmakers who had been caught short. Gambino's squad intelligence sources had already identified Sammy as a rising force in the construction industry, and at Tolly's on Tuesday night, Spiro and Tricarico could see it for themselves. Concrete company executives, building contractors and subcontractors, shop stewards in the construction unions, and the Teamsters all flocking in to eat and drink to touch base with Sammy. Spiro and Tricarico would have been delighted to mix in with the crowd, but there wasn't a chance. Someone with Sammy was always out front, and while there wasn't a closed-door policy, you had to be a recognizable regular from the neighborhood to gain entrance. Spiro and Tricarico would try to get an early parking space to observe the goings-on. Tricarico remembered, there'd be guys on the street, guys coming in and out. It was hard to hide. We used to be out there, two guys in a car, smoking cigars, watching tallies, making notes. And in a sense, we got a lot of information because we saw who came with who from what companies, what unions. Sometimes they would see Sammy himself emerge from tallies and stroll down 18th Avenue with a visitor. Once they saw him in deep conversation with Mario Mastro Marino, chief engineer of the Gems Steel Erection Company. That was especially frustrating. There was no record of Mastro Marino being mobbed up. What were the two of them talking about? Stymie's 18-year-old son, Joey D'Angelo, whom Sammy thought of almost as a son, would cover two or three blocks in each direction, bird-dogging. He'd come by, Spiro recalled, and probably saw us and was back to Sammy reporting. They're down the street. But we were gathering general intelligence. We weren't trying to be discreet. On that block, 
you couldn't be. The two agents considered renting an apartment with a view of Tolly's. However, that wasn't a viable option. Over there in Bensonhurst, Spiro said, the word would spread right away. Hey, guess what? The FBI's on the second floor next to the dentist. There was consideration, as well, of bugging Tollies. But a survey by Jim Kalstrom's special operations team reported that it wasn't worth the effort. The jukebox during these get-togethers was on full blast, and there was the clatter of dishes and a deafening clamor of voices, making it impossible to differentiate one speaker from another. For the Gambino squad's Bruce Mao, Sammy's Tuesday nights at Tally's had another significance. To command such gatherings, Sammy had to be important to the family. Otherwise, John Gotti's vanity was such that he would never have allowed them to take place. For Spiro and Tricarico, there was at least one blessing to their vigils. Sammy was no all-night carouser. By 11 p.m., he was headed home. Meanwhile, consideration was also given to bugging his Stillwell office. It was rejected. The feeling was that Sammy was too cagey. And as it turned out, when the state's organized crime task force eventually did decide to bug the office, thousands of hours of recorded conversations produced nothing of evidentiary value. On Stillwell, Sammy didn't need the teachers or the kids he was playing handball with to tell him he was under surveillance. He became aware of it himself almost at once. In fact, Spiro and Tricarico did not go out of their way to disguise their presence. One of the objects of the surveillance was to let Sammy know he had been targeted, to see how he would react and at least disrupt his normal routine. And to that degree, some success was achieved. After DiBernardo's murder, Sammy became the Gambino family's link to Local 282 of the Teamsters. I had control of the whole thing, Sammy said. The president, who was Bobby Sasso, the vice president, the secretary treasurer, delegates, foreman. If I wanted a foreman in there, I'd tell Bobby, put this guy to work. I told Bobby that DeBee was missing. We were trying to find out what happened to him. I said to report directly to me if he heard anything. From here on in, he was to answer to me on the construction jobs. He wasn't to meet with anybody from any other family unless it was strictly union business. Anything else, any schemes they had, was to go through me or John Gotti. It was for his advantage, too. That way he was protected from anybody leaning on him. I said we shouldn't be seen in public together. There was getting to be too much heat. He wasn't to go to any family weddings and funerals and social functions. We would set up meetings at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning at hotels and motels like the Golden Gate off the Belt Parkway. John called me and said he was changing the structure that pertained to the construction industry. Under Paul, Paul got 75% of what was coming in and DeBee and myself split the other 25 Sammy, he says, you were getting 12.5%. Now you're getting 20, and I'm taking another 5%. John, I said, you're the boss. Whatever you want is good with me. What comes out of the unions and that stuff, I have no problems with because I'm handling it for you. And that's what we did. Other deals were different. Like if I have a legitimate business deal, drywall work, steel erection, that was mine. I'd pass along maybe 20 or 30 percent, whatever I decided. I would give my crew some, give him some, and take some. Even though I was doing all the work, John didn't know anything about construction. I didn't feel uncomfortable giving John his 80 percent. Hey, that's the structure. It belongs to the family boss. The money in that capacity meant nothing to me. The money was coming in. But in these deals, setting them up, I enjoyed the negotiations, giving people a rough time. To tell the truth, I enjoyed the whole process more than the dollar value that was in it. I'm not stupid, and I don't want to be screwed. I'm going after the buck, there's no question about that. But in the give and take, just the money wasn't my ultimate goal. It never was. The deal was the thing. Before it was over, 
Sammy's wheeling and dealing with the Teamsters alone would bring John Gotti about $2 million annually. I don't believe he ever shared a penny of it with anybody, Sammy said. So what did he do with it? I remember one time that Joe Watts came to me and said, Sammy, I'm giving you a tip. When you go down to New York today, he's probably going to look to borrow off you. He's desperate. He's looking for cash. I said, borrow off me? For what? And Joe Watts says, I'll tell you this much. I know for a fact that he lost over 300000 this week in gambling. I know John would never fess that up to me. So I don't think anything more of it. But when I go down that night, sure enough, he asked me how I was sitting how much I was holding. What he was talking about was the money from Bobby Sasso, which I would turn in every five, six weeks, whatever, to his brother Pete Gotti. I said, well, it ain't time yet, but I am holding some money, about a hundred, maybe a little less. If you need it, let Pete come over and I'll give it to him. Yeah, he said, I could use it now. I'm going to give out a big Shylock loan and I'm short. I want to give this one out which was bullshit because I know he's not a Shylock. Now I knew Joe Watts was telling the truth. Another captain, good-looking Jackie, John Giordano, told me the same number a couple of days later. Wow, he said, this fucking John is out of his mind. This guy's betting with two fucking hands. He can't earn enough money. So I had heard it from two people. Plus, he made his little bullshit request that he wanted to push out money that week. God knows what he lost the week before, or the next week. Here's a guy losing 300000 in one week that we know of. And that has nothing to do with his other spending. Clothes, broads, whining and dining, crystal champagne and the discos, weddings, funerals. He went through a ton of money just to keep that persona of Big John Gotti. This ends side two of cassette seven of Underboss. Please fast forward to the end before loading cassette eight.